Oh, hey, didn't see you there. Sorry, I was busy setting up a joke you'll only get if you watch the last part of this series. Birth by Sleep, for me, represents a turning point in the series. This is about when the games really started expanding their narrative to the far reaches of their fictional universe. It introduced a lot of new characters and a lot of new combat mechanics, many of which have become mainstays since their inception. It's also a prequel to Kingdom Hearts 1, and it won't let you forget it. I did not play this game as a kid because I did not own a PSP. Just as a reminder, so far the series has had two games on the PlayStation 2, one on the GBA, one on the DS, and one game on the Panasonic phone. Only one of these is not relevantly canon and extremely vital to one's understanding of the narrative, so we'll ignore the Panasonic phone one. Assuming you bought all games in every console on this list at full price, it would have cost you $937.98 of 2002 to 2010's officially printed United States dollars in order to experience the series. I love talking about this because it's wildly insane and silly that the series was treated this way. Not only was this likely to buck at least some kids at some point due to financial constraints like me just as an example, it also meant that half the games in the series were either vastly different from their console counterparts or they tried to be the same and failed pretty miserably. Birth by Sleep is the closest a handheld game in the series has come to being an experience in parody with the console games up to this point. But how does it hold up to scrutiny? The opening cutscene of this game uses the simple and clean remix from Kingdom Hearts 1. Am I the only one that finds this odd? In fact, a weirdly large number of these games start with this remix. We'll give the first game a pass for obvious reasons, and I suppose Chain of Memories deserves a pass too because it's literally about memories of the first game. Then Kingdom Hearts 2 has Sanctuary, a different song with a different meaning more fitting to that game's narrative. Days used Sanctuary as well, solidifying that song as belonging to Roxas. Recoded used Simple and Clean again, and at that point it started feeling a little odd, but still thematically appropriate as that game focused on Sora. Now, with Birth by Sleep, it starts to feel exceptionally weird. Lyrically speaking, what does this song have to do with this game? I mean, some people don't even think it lyrically matches the first game, but I think I made a pretty strong argument that it does, but here, it's awfully strange, and begins at this point to feel like a token inclusion. These are new characters going through entirely unique locations and issues, and a new song would have made much more sense. I understand if that would have been a little too financially challenging for a game that was slated to be released on a handheld, but then that calls into question the myriad games in the series released on handhelds, treated like handheld games, and yet containing more pivotal plot significance at this point in the chronology than the actual first game in the series due to the number of <laughs> retcons present since its creation. Yes, if you don't believe that these games retconned many, many plot details as they evolved, you probably have never met a retcon in person. I have, and they are much more complex than you think. We'll get to that later. Continuing with bizarre details present entirely through this graphically impressive cutscene, this time the point of the cutscene is actually just to spoil the story. If you really pay attention to this one, you'll know the entire plot before the cutscene is over. Now I don't think this is a bad thing, because the journey these characters take is inarguably more important than the destination they get to. We know none of these people are active players by the time Kingdom Hearts 1 rolls around, so we can assume that every one of these characters either dies or transforms into someone else by the end. In typical prequel fashion, the intrigue comes in how they get to that point, and how everything they did ties into the stories which take place in the future. Look to Metal Gear Solid 3 for an excellent example of this, in which details present in the previous games, especially Metal Gear Solid 1, are extrapolated upon and given new context which serves to make that game better as a result. Characters perhaps make more sense, or are at least more interesting, you understand how they got where they are, and how they developed into the people they are, why their motivations are what they are. Does Birth by Sleep do this? Well, yes and no. That frustratingly vague statement means that it tries, but falls into some pitfalls present in many prequels of its ilk. While I don't think its tying forward into the future games chronologically fails outright, there is one particular crutch that they lean on, and boy do they lean on it hard. As we discuss this section, you might be able to pick up on what that crutch is. The opening cutscene flows right into a scene in which a man carries a huge sack of flour on his shoulder on Destiny Island. He lays this boy over the Tangent-esque Palpu fruit tree and then leaves. Then we see him standing on the dive to the heart, a shatter in the side and no color present. This boy looks peculiarly like Roxas, though it is unclear why at this time. He talks to some voice, at which point we can tell he also sounds like Roxas, being voiced by Jesse McCartney. 
This brand new heart followed the boy's light here and offers to join with him so he can be whole again. This has to qualify as one of the strangest things in the game so far. A newborn heart appears to talk to this boy out of nowhere, and through merging their hearts together, he is able to get a complete heart once again. Presumably this newborn heart literally belongs to a baby. In fact, in an interview, Nomura stated exactly this, and that it belongs to someone I won't spoil just yet before his birth, though this idea was changed slightly in order to avoid conflicting with Western ideals on the existence of life before birth. It's simultaneously heartwarming and exceptionally disturbing that Nomura had to change such a nice detail because people in the West are insane, but that's really a topic for a video I assuredly won't ever make. Back on Destiny Island, the boy suddenly raises his hand in the air, a keyblade forming. Next, we move to a new location for the series, the Land of Departure. This boy looks out his window and sees a meteor shower and takes off to go watch it. On the way down, we get a brief tutorial on some basic movement mechanics as well as basic combat. The boy, laying on the grass, leering up at the stars, wonders why this seems so familiar, when a blue-haired girl appears above him in a shockingly familiar scene. Already we are seeing that this game has a massive nostalgia itch for the first game, and these characters are likely parallels to them in some way. The boy, Ventus, remarks that the meteor shower felt familiar, and the girl, Aqua, reminds him that he's always lived here with us. Another boy, Terra, walks into the scene, brandishing a metaphor like a shiv into the back of the unassuming conversation. They say that every star up there is another world. Then they share an eccentric dialogue. What? I don't get it. In other words, they're just like you, Ven. What does that mean? You'll find out someday, I'm sure. I want to know now. You're too young to know now. Quit treating me like a kid. <laughs> hey, what are you laughing at? I can't help it. You two would make the weirdest brothers. <laughs> huh? huh? <laughs> we learn that they have what they call the Mark of Mastery exam tomorrow, and then Aqua produces these and says this. Somewhere out there, there's this tree with star-shaped fruit. And the fruit represents an unbreakable connection. So as long as you and your friends carry good luck charms shaped like it, nothing can ever drive you apart. You will always find your way back to each other. Technically, I think you're supposed to make them with seashells, <laughs> but I did the best with what I had. Oh, sometimes you are such a girl. So this isn't a real good luck charm? Well, that's yet to be seen. But I did work a little magic on it. Really? What? An unbreakable connection. In Kingdom Hearts 1, the Palpu fruit could be seen as actually containing the power Riku says it has, or it could just be an urban legend among the people living at Destiny Islands. Sora and Kairi never actually share a Palpu fruit, though they make this connection happen for themselves through trial and hardship. With this scene, we now have to reckon with the fact that the urban legend of the Palpu fruit has somehow traveled countless worlds away. Most of these people have never been to Destiny Islands, and for many, many generations at this point, the worlds have been locked away from each other. And yet somehow, Aqua knows about this tree. It would make more sense if Aqua knew exactly where the tree was, because then the implication would be she's been to Destiny Islands, but this actually implies she heard about the tree secondhand through someone else, which is even more strange. Ventus has been to the island, but he doesn't remember any of it. Xehanort has been to the island, but why would he care about an urban legend like this? He's too busy sounding like he needs an oil change. How frustrating that Erekus refutes its power. What the game is doing here is trading logical consistency for symbolic connection to its predecessor, while also giving this tree significantly more importance in the universe of this series than it ever had before. Aqua also places on the Wayfinders, the little charms made to look like the Palpu fruit, some bafflingly vague magic, which apparently creates an unbreakable connection between them. This at least doesn't undermine the fact that there is no magic in the good luck charm of the first game, as Sora had to work towards saving himself and Kyrie, and isn't just saved by MacGuffin magic at random, authorially appointed times. Let's hope that doesn't happen in this game. The trio watch the meteor shower and remark how they will always be together before immediately turning around and, in unison, saying this. That would be the last night we ever spent beneath the same stars. This is supposed to be a bit of dark foreshadowing, but I can't help finding the juxtaposition of these two lines humorous. We get a brief scene of a young King Mickey training his emergency surfboarding skills with the help of Yen Sid's magic. Yen Sid says he can't shake the feeling something terrible is about to transpire. As the final piece of this opening, we now get to choose what character we play as. This game has a similar structure to every other game in the series, it's just chopped up into three stories in which you play as a different character. 
Each of the trio has a different gameplay style implied by their stats. Each of the trio goes to every world in the game, though the first three worlds happen in a different order for each. In order to understand the full story, you must play through the game three times. This may seem ambitious, but what this ends up amounting to is actually the most recycled content these games have had so far. Each character will typically go to a different section of each world, and their stories there are wholly unique. And usually they fight different bosses, but ultimately this is the most copy-pasted game in the series yet. Here's why I find this funny. This is also, without a doubt in my mind, the longest game in the series thus far. In my playthrough, I beelined all the worlds and only grinded as much as I needed to in order to get through. Oh, believe me, I'm going to talk about that later. But I would say I beat each of the stories about as fast as I could given that I was on the hardest difficulty. My final in-game time prior to the secret episode came out to 28 hours, 5 minutes, and 51 seconds. For sake of comparison, KH1 took a measly 15 hours to beat, and KH2 took 24 hours. You'll remember that KH2 also had a good bit of repeated content in the second trip to each world. Birth by Sleep basically does this as well, except it's three trips instead of two. So why the need to pad this game out with a bunch of repeated content? Well, there's a decent story reason to be sure. The main theme of this game is connection and the stories of the Disney worlds attempt to explore that theme throughout each visit to them. While the actual time spent in the Disney worlds is pretty dull overall, I'd say the exploration into this theme is worth it. We'll look at some examples of this later. What this means from a gameplay standpoint is that you start from level 1 and must work your way up three times as you stride toward completing the game. Each character starts with a preliminary set of moves they can use, and each character has a set of powerful moves unique to them, but I do still think this is perhaps a bit of a misstep. This too is clearly a story-driven decision, as it wouldn't make sense to start the characters at anything other than level 1 just because doing so would be boring. Oh wait, wouldn't it? Terra and Aqua literally both complete their Mark of Mastery exams, and both of them exhibit qualities and strengths of actual Keyblade Masters during them. They've been training for years, why do they start at level 1 with a decidedly basic moveset? I'm not necessarily asking for in-game moves right from the get-go, but what if you could inherit certain moves from past playthroughs when you start as a new character? Since the strength of the command scales with your stats, they wouldn't necessarily even be overpowered, at least not more overpowered than anything in this game already is. I don't know, I think something could have been done here to make the early hours of each character's stories less boring from a gameplay perspective, but any option I come up with feels like it would require a slight reworking of the gameplay or perhaps even story structure in order to function properly. The latter is perhaps not worth the trade-off, but the former, well, let's just say this game's structure and design both needed some work anyway, so that might not have been a bad thing. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, though. The recommended playthrough order is actually the order they appear in this list. Terra, Vin, and then Aqua. Funny things happen when you play in this order, both from a gameplay and narrative perspective that I'll touch on in a bit. For now, let's pick Terra and go over the first few scenes, which play out the same for every character. We jump straight into the Mark of Mastery exam. Ericus, their master, summons some balls of light. Xehanort, their other master who is extremely and obviously evil, turns them dark and they start wigging out. I'm unsure what the test was originally supposed to be, but you end up fighting the light balls as whichever character you picked. Aqua wants Ven to leave and stay safe, but Terra says that he can protect himself. After the fight, Ericus then has Aqua and Terra spar in a cutscene. Missed opportunity for a boss fight, but okay. After deliberation amongst the two masters, Ericus decides to reward Aqua the Mark of Mastery, telling Terra that he couldn't control the darkness within him during that last fight. Terra leaves angry, and the trio go their separate ways as we see Xehanort speak to a boy in a mask, telling him he must keep up appearances. This is where the opening for each character splits into different cutscene paths. Xehanort walks by Terra on the steps of the castle, telling him that Ericus will never let him become master, even though he's fine the way he is. Xehanort leaves as Terra runs back up the stairs. Ericus then tells Aqua and Terra they need to go to the worlds and deal with a new creature that Ian Sid has dubbed Unversed, as well as protect the princesses of Heart and find Master Xehanort, who literally just left, and yet Ericus says his repeated attempts to contact him have failed. This is the first of many examples we will see that the writers of this game didn't fully understand how to keep the continuity of these branching stories in check. Ericus talks to Terra squarely about his shortcomings, and Terra heads back down the stairs, saying he won't fail Ericus again. Meanwhile, the masked boy from before meets Ventus in his room and tells him in no uncertain terms that today will be the last time he ever sees Terra. Then immediately leaves and meets Terra outside as he's getting ready to take off. Terra shuts him down before putting on his familiar set of armor and then flies into a portal in the air. Vin follows behind, and Aqua leaves moments later, Ericus telling her that she has to bring Vin back. Thus, we launch into the game proper. 
Now that we have truly begun, let's discuss the overall gameplay structure, focusing primarily on the new additions to this iteration. We'll discuss the movement, defensive options, and basic combos later. This is the first game in the series to use the command deck style of combat, which we looked at in the Recoded video. In this game, the command deck represents your primary form of offense. It actually comes as a reimagining of the deck building combat of Chain of Memories, simplifying it significantly while also making it a degree more varied. Rather than having to stock three cards together in order to perform some sort of powerful move, you simply set the powerful move itself to a slot in your deck and press a single button to activate it. It recharges over time and can be used as many times during combat as need be, limited only by said recharge timer. There are lots of different types of attacks, many of them organized by certain parameters. The biggest umbrellas are whether the command scales with your strength stat or your magic stat. The former usually uses the keyblade to attack directly, where the latter usually uses some sort of magic spell. Starting with physical commands, there are a number of different kinds of attacks that can be performed, and many of these can be augmented with an element to do extra damage to enemies weak to said element. Edge attacks are big overhead strikes, raids are like strike raid, dashes cover long distances in a straight line, surges cover short distances in a small bubble around the player, and strikes have small AoEs around the player. Similar to a surge but covering less ground. Most of these attacks lock you to the ground, and if used in the air will cause the player to plummet to the ground instantaneously before performing the attack. This reduces their chain ability, so you've really got to be careful with your deck composition if you want these attacks to feel even slightly decent. Magic commands come in many different varieties. Most of the usual suspects make a return, but let's just give a quick overview. Fire is a homing fireball. Blizzard is a single shot that penetrates enemies. Both of these are similar to past iterations. Thunder is slightly unique in that it is an AoE which hits any enemy within a circle around the player, the size of which is determined by which version of Thunder it is. Arrow lifts enemies in the air with a chance to stun them. I find it odd that Arrow has lost all of his identity after Kingdom Hearts 1. I have to wonder why. Zero Gravity suspends enemies in the air, stunning them, and damage dealt during this time is increased. Stop makes the enemies stop for a while. Cure heals the player. Mind Shield and Mind Square both place a certain number of mines on the field based on the level of the command, tripping when enemies get too close, usually sending them into the air and stunning them for a time. Slow slows enemies down for a while. Poison and Ignite both deal tick damage over time. Many shrinks enemies down to tiny size. Blackout blinds enemies so that they can't attack properly. Confuse confuses enemies, causing them to act erratically. Bind binds enemies, causing them to stay in one place. Sleep puts enemies to sleep. There's a lot of magic in this game, and you may have noticed that much of it is redundant. Beyond all that, there are unique commands which behave in many different ways. Triple Faraga and Mega Flare both come to mind. The former sends out three Faraga balls in quick succession, while the latter is essentially a screen nuke. Each character also has a set of commands which only they can use, each of which tie into their character in some way. Terra has earth-based attacks, but also attacks which use darkness. Vin's attacks all focus on wind, as well as emphasizing his speed. Aqua's commands mostly focus on highly powered magic. Many commands are only really useful on mob fights because of their long wind-up times, while some commands are clearly designed to be used on bosses. Mega Flare is a great example of an attack meant for mob fights, courtesy of its relatively low single-target damage but high multi-target damage. Very few commands that work well for bosses don't in some way work for mob fights, but commands like Thunder Surge deal a lot of damage in a small radius and notably keep the player invulnerable for the duration, making them excellent for bosses, especially. Another new mechanic in this game is the command style system. As you hit enemies with attacks, whether they be physical combos or commands, you will fill this bar above the command deck. Once it's full, it will do a few potential things depending on what forms of attack you are using. If you only used physical combos, it'll give you a special finisher. There are many of these, each with their own requirements to unlock them, and many having unique use cases which make them valuable. If you used commands, it'll give you a command style determined by the element of the command. Certain other attack types, like retaliations, also contribute to this gauge. The command style itself is a new form, essentially, that gives you a new physical combo and usually an elemental affinity as well. Each one has unique animations, attack patterns, and finishers. Later in the game, you can get a second command style stage, meaning that after your first command style, you can continue to chain together commands to unlock a second stage, again determined by the elemental type of the commands. These second stage styles are significantly more powerful than the first, and often end with huge screen nuking finishers. These are powerful against mobs, but even bosses can get tossed by these if you know how to use them. Many of the combos here are similar to some of the combos present in KH2 form changes. They cover large swaths of the arena, deal a bunch of damage, but are largely unsafe because of their duration and commitment requirement. This is further exacerbated by bosses rarely staggering, but that's a discussion for a bit later. 
Yet another new mechanic is the shot lock system. Holding the lock on button sends you into first person, a big targeting reticle plastered on the screen. Hold it over enemies to increase the lock on count. The focus gauge slowly depletes as you do this. Pressing the attack button will activate the shot lock, a long range attack that hits whatever enemies are nearby. The higher the lock on count, the more hits you'll deal, and if you max the lock on count, it'll give you a bonus finisher that deals even more damage. There are a number of different types of shot locks, but the most common are projectiles, salvos, and rushes. They each have their strengths and weaknesses. Shot locks also keep you completely invincible for their duration, giving them a similar place in the meta as limits from KH2. These are utterly busted, frankly, but we'll go over their usefulness in the meta more later. Finally, there's D-Links, or Dimension Links. You get these usually at the end of the Disney Worlds, but at other junction points as well, and they are basically calling upon the power of a friend you have met throughout the game in order to use said power. They heal you to full when used, and drain the D-Link bar while active. You need a full D-Link bar to activate them. They replace your command deck with one themed after the person in question. Most of these just come in the form of what that character would be good at in combat, like Donald having magic commands solely, or Zack having all physical offensive commands and no healing, but some of them are actually a little more unique, like Snow White's changing the names of the commands to the Seven Dwarves. Each of these also has multiple unique finishers depending on the level of the D-Link. You level them up by finding these star pieces dropped by enemies while in a D-Link, and each level gets you more or upgraded commands and an ability unique to that D-Link, up to level 3. Level 3 also unlocks an upgraded finisher for the D-Link, and changes the art displayed on the HUD when the D-Link is active. The abilities are wild, some allow you to auto-block attacks, some increase your strength or magic, and some are even more unique. A notable standout being Vin's haste ability, which makes your physical combos extremely fast. D-Links are thematically pretty interesting. They are quite powerful, and it's actually satisfyingly appropriate for a game whose main theme is connection to make a combat system revolving around connection and then make it borderline overpowered. Especially noticeable at level 1, a fully upgraded D-Link can absolutely tear through bosses. Considering you are completely invulnerable during finishers and most of these last about a year or so, and they often deal repeated and elongated attacks, they basically function as limits from KH2 with less opportunity cost. The only real form of balancing there is for this system is the fact that they don't all have reliable healing methods. Like I mentioned a moment ago, Zack's D-Link doesn't have any healing methods at all. Barring this, they are exceptionally powerful and easy to use. Some of them give you access to some of the more powerful commands well before you could feasibly get them yourself. Though this is probably more just to the fact that I didn't do any command farming in the command board during my playthroughs. I could have melted stronger commands faster. Regardless, D-Links are cool. Don't sleep on them like I did because they're fun to play around with beyond just using them as panic heal. They can't be used in the Mirage Arena because on the PSP version there was a multiplayer that kept you from using them. The multiplayer is gone in the 2.5 Remix version though, so I'm not sure why they couldn't have been re-enabled for this area, but whatever. Let's talk about the story for a bit. The Disney Worlds, Enchanted Dominion, Castle of Dreams, Dwarf Woodlands, Disney Town, Olympus Coliseum, Deep Space, and Neverland present their stories in three rarely overlapping chunks, each focusing on one of the main characters as they travel through the world and solve problems in pursuit of whatever completely unrelated to that world goal they have. There are some Costco brand beanbag chair sized problems with the way that this was handled, primarily in the continuity between the stories. I'm going to try to lay this out in a way that makes sense so you can see the issues clearly. Each character has a first world which they must go to before being able to go to the other two. The second two worlds for each character are completable in either order. But for the sake of argument, I think it's reasonable to say there is a canon order intended because the worlds have a battle level akin to KH1. For example, Terra's first world is Enchanted Dominion, and he can go to Castle of Dreams or Dwarf Woodlands in either order, but Castle of Dreams is battle level 2, where Dwarf Woodlands is battle level 3, meaning the game mechanics funnel you to one of the two worlds naturally. Given this fact, you would think it'd be pretty easy to write the stories in such a way that they are logically consistent, but we run into a problem in literally the first world for each character and then every world after that point too. I'm going to start by laying out the story of the first three Disney worlds as plainly as possible, just the raw events here. Enchanted Dominion starts out with Terra showing up and being convinced by Maleficent to release Aurora's heart. He does so, kinda, and then leaves. Vin then shows up, vows to get her heart back, and then beats up Maleficent. Aqua shows up thereafter and has to fight her way out of the castle dungeon before confronting Maleficent on the bridge, who transforms into Maleficent Dragon. I would like to take a brief pause here to say that I find it odd that Maleficent can just do this at will when it was pretty clear from her pre-boss cutscene in KH1 that the experience of transforming into Maleficent Dragon was new and strange to her. Writing prequels is hard, I guess. Castle of Dreams is next, and for this one, Vin gets there first and helps Jack, 
collect items to build Cinderella a dress. Next, Tara shows up, finds Cinderella in that same dress but with a gash in it. The stepsisters have destroyed the dress so she couldn't go to the ball. After fighting off some unversed, the very godmother shows up and pulls her bippity boppity bullcrap and Cinderella rides off to the ball. Tara escorts her past the unversed and into the ballroom where she dances with the prince. Later, she runs off like in the movie, leaving her slipper behind and Aqua shows up not long after. Tara and Aqua share a brief conversation and then Tara leaves. Aqua goes to the Tremaine estate and helps Jack free Cinderella from her locked room, allowing her to escape and try on the slipper. Finally, Dwarfwood Lance starts with Tara meeting the evil queen and asking her where Xehanort is. She says she doesn't know, but that she'd ask the magic mirror if Tara would only kill Snow White. He goes off to find her, vowing to not actually kill her, but when he does, Unversed appear and Snow White escapes into the forest. Tara heads back and fights the magic mirror, thereafter asking it where Xehanort is. The magic mirror gives him an answer that he understands and he heads that way. At some point, probably overlapping slightly with Tara's story, Vin shows up and finds the dwarves in the mine. They run from him because they don't trust him. He finds them, they still don't really help him, and he gets ready to leave before the main dwarf guy tells him to check in the forest. Vin helps Snow White when he finds her, telling her to stay in the cottage he found earlier. Turns out, it's the very same cottage the dwarves live in. Moments later, Vin runs into the old hag, also known as the Evil Queen in disguise, who tells him that she doesn't know where Tara is. Later, Aqua shows up, Snow White having at this point eaten the apple and died. Aqua says she'll go to the castle and help. For some reason, the magic mirror attacks her as well, so she beats it up. The mirror then tells her that the queen is gone, and so Aqua leaves to go mourn Snow White. The prince, who showed up at the castle, gives her a kiss and she wakes up. My favorite part of this world is that Aqua accomplishes literally nothing here. Now that we've briefly overviewed the stories, let's talk continuity. For sake of discussion, each character leaves at the exact same time. This isn't entirely true, but the difference between their departure times is so minuscule that it's not even worth worrying about for this discussion. Tara leaves first, immediately followed by Vin, then followed by Aqua after a brief conversation with Ericus. Tara then goes to Enchanted Dominion first, spends a fairly short amount of time there, then goes to Castle of Dreams. He meets Cinderella, escorts her to the ball, and then fights a big unversed themed after a maestro for some reason. Vin then Aqua shows up. Aqua's first world is Castle of Dreams, and it begins by running into Terra. It took the equivalent of Terra completing two worlds in order for Aqua to show up to her first, when the only difference between the two is about 50 seconds of cutscene. If this was the only continuity issue present, I probably wouldn't be writing this section. Terra, after this point, goes to Dwarf Woodlands. Thanks to the story details such as the old hag thinking Vin looks like Terra, as well as the location of Snow White, we know that Terra shows up there first in the continuity. Unfortunately, Dwarf Woodlands is actually Vin's first world. So in the time it took Terra to travel through three worlds, Vin still hadn't gotten to his first. It's possible that Vin's and Terra's stories here overlap somewhat, but that still doesn't account for the time difference here. If there were only these two problems with the continuity, I probably wouldn't be writing this section. Vin's second world is Castle of Dreams. In order for the broader story here to make sense, Vin's entire visit to this world must be done before Terra even steps foot in it. However, this also must happen after Vin's first visit to Dwarf Woodlands, which is Terra's third world, meaning he would already be done with his visit to Castle of Dreams by then. Even if we switch the order of Terra's second two worlds, that changes basically nothing because then Terra would need to be doing nothing for an unbelievable amount of time before Vin's story in Dwarf Woodlands is over. If we flip Vin's second two worlds, that only makes the problem on Terra side worse. Moving on to Aqua, her first world is, as previously stated, Castle of Dreams, which conflicts with both Terra's and Ven's stories. Ven has to be the first person there, but it's his second world, so Aqua actually had to wait two worlds for Ven and one world for Terra before she showed up to her first. She's actually the third person to get to every world, and you'd think at a glance that this would make sense because she's the last person to leave the Land of Departure, but this isn't the case because they all left at the same time and went to different worlds at the offset. There are two ways this structure could have been made better. First, if Terra left significantly earlier than everyone else, followed by Vin a while after, and then Aqua a while after that, then every character would need to get to each world in the order they left in. Terra first, Vin second, Aqua third. The second option would be to have each character leave in the same time frame they do now, but go to one of the worlds first, 
the next second, then the next third. Since every character already goes to a different world to start out with, this wouldn't be difficult to accomplish. Terra goes to Enchanted Dominion, Vin goes to Dwarf Woodlands, and Aqua goes to Castle of Dreams, just as an example. In their stories, they would be first to those worlds, then they'd be second to get to whatever world they go to next, followed by third to get to whichever world after that. This is probably the best way to preserve some continuity elements present later in the game, while still solving this problem in the first few Disney worlds. My presumption is that they either thought no one would notice because you're highly encouraged to get to the end of one character's journey before starting another, and therefore didn't feel the need to fix it, or they just didn't notice the logical inconsistencies here. I'm presuming it's not the latter, considering it took me 10 minutes in logsec to draw lines between the worlds in order to see there was an issue. Continuity-wise, things do get better later in the game, though not perfect. There are even some moments where the continuity is properly considered and accounted for. Eventually, all of the characters end up at Radiant Garden and must all get to the same location in order to fight a boss together. Aqua is almost late to this meetup, but a shortcut to where the boss is going opens up just as she is passing through, allowing her to catch up around the same time that Terra and Ven do, both of which got to Radiant Garden a bit earlier and spent less time screwing around with Kyrie. I like this detail because it shows that the writers were thinking about how these things worked and it mattered to them. For the same reason, this detail confuses me because I then have to wonder why the first three Disney worlds are so poorly thought out. The last real continuity issue comes in when the characters leave Radiant Garden. Terra leaves first, as seen in this cutscene. Then Vin finds Aqua and she leaves. Vin deliberately stays for a while. He sits for a fade to blackly implied amount of time before meeting up with Lee and sparring with him. Then he finally leaves after that. So Terra leaves, Aqua leaves maybe a few minutes after him, then Ven leaves a good while after both. The problem here is that in the following world, Disney Town, Aqua's story has to take place last because the characters of that world refer to both Terra and Ven during an awards ceremony. After Disney Town, things are actually pretty logical, if not a little vague. Olympus Coliseum doesn't go out of its way to make it clear what order the characters show up in, just that Terra's story has to happen before Aqua's. Neverland makes it clear that Terra goes first, followed by Vin, then Aqua, which is fine. Everything from there on is straightforward and well thought out enough to not be distracting. Honestly, the continuity of these stories is kind of baffling to me. I understand that it's probably difficult for the team to keep track of three stories taking place across three versions of the game that have to fit Jigsaw puzzleishly into each other, but I feel like there were some pretty straightforward changes that could have been made in order to accomplish this better. Perhaps there is a reason they wanted each character to go through the specific story beats they did. For example, Vin's story beat for Castle of Dreams involves finishing Cinderella's dress, which must happen before any other. If anyone else went there first, they could also have performed this task, but was there a more significant reason for making sure Vin did that specific story beat that I'm missing here? This is definitely the case for some of the story beats. For example, Aqua's visit to Castle of Dreams sees her helping Jack free Cinderella from her entrapment. She plans on busting down the door and fighting the problem head on, but the fairy godmother stops her and tells her not to fight darkness with light. Confused, Aqua asks her what she means. She explains that bright lights only cast larger shadows, and so she should be wary of that approach. Aqua asks her what she should do, and the fairy godmother points her in the direction of Jack, who is, in essence, trying to allow Cinderella's light to shine, rather than adding a light of his own. This lesson was no doubt important to the writers for Aqua to learn, and so her placement in the order for that world was likely set in stone because of that. It's also important that Aqua be able to see the ramifications of Terra's actions, as that's a critical plot detail that serves as attempted character development for both of them at the halfway point in Radiant Garden. As for her trip to the other two worlds, she barely does anything in either of them. In Dwarf Woodland, she beats up the mirror and has a flashback to Ven, which is brought on by Snow White waking up. In Enchanted Dominion, she gets locked up and then beats up Maleficent, thereafter watching Aurora get revived. While it is important that she sees the ramifications of Terra's actions, the only world in which that really matters is Enchanted Dominion anyway. Similarly, it is clear to me that Terra needs to be the first person to reach Enchanted Dominion. He has to be the one to take Aurora's heart, or at least think he did, because it sets him on his development course for the rest of the game. From there, however, there is nothing inherently tying him to the first place position in any other world prior to Radiant Garden. It's important that he meets Cinderella, because he learns from the fairy godmother about believing in oneself and helping others to believe in themselves through that. This is the second story beat that takes place in that world though, so this is not a significant issue. The only important thing that happens with Terra in Dwarf Woodlands is that he asks the mirror where Xehanort is and gets a vague answer, so that could happen at any point during the story. In fact, Terra's and Vin's stories here could reasonably happen at the same time, since Terra 
barely leaves the castle and Vin barely leaves the forest. In this case, nothing would change. Their placements in the story could also be flipped with no issue to my knowledge. Vin's stories are not as significant as the other two, I'd say, and any lessons he learns during them are interchangeable or could be learned in any of the other story beats. One exception to this is Enchanted Dominion, in which he learns that Terra stole Aurora's heart. He doesn't believe her, but a seed of doubt is placed here that will grow inside Vin for the remainder of the game. Similarly, though less important, I'd say, is in Dwarf Woodlands, where the old hag says that Terra pointed a keyblade at her and asked for Xehanort. Again, seeds of doubt, dependent on Terra visiting the world before him. Castle of Dreams is just a vague sort of platitude about believing, similar to Terra's excursion here, so these stories could be flipped for whatever it's worth. So what can I do with this? Well, to be honest, not much. If we keep the time frame the same as it currently is, as in the characters all leave at roughly the same time, this is an impossible task to achieve. Inevitably, because there are so many situations in which a character must show up to a location after another one or even both of the other characters, there is simply no way to make this flowchart look like anything other than a big ol' pot of al dente spaghetti noodles. However, if you simply set up the story so that each character left in a staggered pattern, maybe Terra at dawn, Vin a couple hours later, and Aqua a couple more hours later, you would only need to change one thing for the stories to make sense. Make Terra the first person to get to Castle of Dreams, have him help make the dress, and he can still learn about believing during that story because Vin already does this in his visit to the world. Then, Terra would have all the first story beats, Vin would have all the second story beats, and Aqua would have all of the third story beats. Then, all you would need to do is explain the time lost Terra and Vin would have to endure in order to meet up with Aqua in Radiant Garden and your Golden. All the relevant story significance is there without any of the continuity issues. Some of the Disney stories would have to be rewritten slightly due to the implied hours of difference between their visits, but this wouldn't be difficult. They could still meet each other if Terra, for instance, went to Castle of Dreams last and Aqua went there first, ensuring the time gap between their stories was logically considered. Then, Aqua could go to Enchanted Dominion second and Vin could go there last, in order to explain Vin finishing up his visit right as Aqua starts hers. She finishes with Dwarf Woodlands while the other two characters get sidetracked to the Badlands, the Mysterious Tower, or for any number of story demanded reasons, so that they could meet at Radiant Garden to fight Trinity Armor and have a miniature falling out. But ultimately, whether this continuity issue matters to you or not will determine if you think it's worth changing anything in the story to address it. After all, like I said, there's quite a bit of distance between experiencing the individual story beats, meaning the continuity issues are not as noticeable to casual players not writing long-winded videos on the matter. It may not even be worth worrying about, although the glaring problem of Aqua getting to Castle of Dreams as Terra is finishing up even though they left within minutes of each other is a noticeable problem even when casually experiencing the game. Barring that, I do think this is a mostly ignorable issue, though an issue nonetheless. One problem I don't think is so ignorable is the presentation of the Disney worlds. This is the most barren, lifeless, and dull the worlds have felt in the series thus far, excepting maybe Rechain of Memories which had a good reason for it to be so. No world presents this better than Castle of Dreams. This world is based on Cinderella, and is a direct retelling of the story thereof, meaning it involves the ball scene. As of writing this, I have no idea what this scene looks like in the movie. As of reading this into a microphone, I have no idea what this scene looks like in the movie. And yet, I don't need to, because the scene where Cinderella and the prince dance at the ball is laughably barren. Literally the only people at this ball are Cinderella, the prince, his steward, the Tremaines, and either Terra or Aqua depending on the scene. This is supposed to be a hugely important, most extravagant moment of the year event, and yet there aren't enough people in this castle to fill a Cadillac Escalade. What I find kind of funny about this is that, in Terra's visit to Enchanted Dominion, the lack of people is actually a minor story detail. Someone named Flora cast a spell on everyone in the castle to put them into a deep slumber. This handily explains why there's no one around without drawing a bunch of attention to it. Truth be told, I have no idea if this is just a borrowed plot detail from the movie because I haven't seen it, but the Wikipedia plot synopsis doesn't imply Flora or anyone else casting a spell on the denizens of the castle is a plot detail. If it is unique to this game, then it makes me wonder why that detail was considered while Cinderella's ball was not. That being said, I'm not sure there is a story reason you could give that would make the ball not having people make any sort of satisfying sense, so maybe they just opted to ignore it. There's also an issue with the way a few of these story beats are handled, i.e. the presence of Terra, Aqua, or Vin feels basically irrelevant. Actually, this isn't a problem for Terra, as he is the plot instigator for basically every world. Vin's story beats have moments like this. 
For example, his trip to Dwarf Woodland starts with him having to go through the mine to find the dwarves because they wouldn't give him the information he needed. After pummeling them with the broadside of a keyblade, they still tell him to go away, imagine that leaving him with only a go to the forest in his wake. Had they not done this, Vin would have still gone there because it's the only place remaining to go, meaning this entire scene is pointless. Aquas are the worst of the three though. Her entire trip to Dwarf Woodlands is a colossal waste of time. She doesn't accomplish what she sets out to do and ends up fighting the magic mirror for no discernible reason before going back to the cottage, at which point the prince saves Snow White from eternal slumber. She accomplishes nothing during all of this. I've also realized that a lot of this is annoying or feels irrelevant because there will be times when the characters are helping to fulfill an event that already took place in the movie, meaning their presence is theoretically unnecessary for the event to take place. Like Jack opening Cinderella's room with the key, or Maleficent getting slain in dragon form by the prince, or again, Snow White being revived by the prince. This, I think, is the main reason I feel like retelling the stories beat for beat with Kingdom Hearts characters is usually a bad idea, on top of the fact that it typically means our characters feel more like afterthoughts in the narrative than active players, because they're being inserted into a story that wasn't written for them. Had the stories of these worlds been unique to the game, they could have been written in a way to give the Kingdom Hearts characters a central role or focus on their character development more than the plot of the Disney film the world is based on. I've been beating this drum the whole time though, and it's only getting worse, so maybe Nomura just doesn't want to listen to me. One positive thing about the Disney worlds is that they all feed into the primary theme of the game, that being connection. Since that's the theme the game aims to explore, the structure of the story is actually pretty smart. The actions of the characters have direct reactions in the story beats the rest of the characters go through, such as Terra taking Aurora's heart, being the progenitor of the story. This, on its own, constitutes an exploration of the theme of connection, as each character's story is literally connected by threads of continuity that the other characters sew into the fabric of the narrative. However, the exploration doesn't just stop there. Each of the worlds more directly explores the theme and the lessons each character learns during their stay. For example, Terra learns from the fairy godmother in Castle of Dreams that the belief of one can help the unbelief of another. This is a lesson that I believe Terra carries through the rest of the story, and it helps him to hold onto his humanity for as long as he can. Later, we get another great example of this in Neverland. The basic story of this world is as follows. Peter Pan and Hook are essentially fighting over some treasure. The Lost Boys find the treasure with Terra's help, but the treasure chest itself is empty. Terra then tells them to fill the chest with things that matter to them, their own personal treasures. Later, Vin helps Peter Pan take care of Captain Hook, and the Lost Boys show up with the empty chest. They put a bunch of stuff in the chest, Vin putting his old wooden keyblade in it, saying he won't be needing it anymore because he's got Aqua and Terra, and their best memories are still ahead. Finally, Aqua ends up finding Vanitas, who breaks the wooden keyblade in half. After defeating him, Aqua remarks that bonds cannot be broken so easily, and that this is probably why Ventus left the keyblade behind. This is actually really good, effective writing, and once again, it follows a plot unique to the game that doesn't just copy the movies. The fact that this comes right before some of the most dark and depressing scenes in the series just makes these stories all the more potent in hindsight. But that's enough about the boring story nonsense, let's talk about beating people up in even more detail. Some might even say painful, excruciating detail. Starting with movement and defensive options. This is actually a bit more of a nuanced discussion than past games have been because each character has a slightly different movement set or feel to their movement. They all can jump and later can equip an air slide which affords you some extra mobility in the air. Each character also gets access to high jump later in the game. That's all that they share, however, which drastically affects how it feels to play each character. Terra doesn't get glide at all, and his version of dodge roll is a slow dash with a gross amount of ending lag to it. He feels much more grounded than the other characters, appropriate due to his earthy theming and name. Ventus is the only character that gets access to glide or super glide. His dodge roll is more akin to that possessed by Sora in the original games, almost like they're connected somehow. He also gets reversal, allowing him to whip around to the back of enemies to simultaneously dodge attacks and get a good opening for retaliation. Sort of reminiscent of someone else we know. Aqua is the only character which gets double flight, an ability similar to air dodge from Kingdom Hearts 2, though I don't think it has the godly parry capabilities from that game, probably because parries are a thing of the past, more on that later. Her dodge roll is called Cartwheel. It's snappy and quick to execute and has zero lag on the front or back end. She also gets Teleport, which allows her to do something similar to Vin's reversal ability. Each character also gets access to Block, though it is slightly different for each character. Terra's and Vin's are similar, just a standard block that parries back enemy attacks. Aqua has a barrier that shields her on all sides. While this sounds cool, it comes with some ugly ending lag that the other characters don't have to worry about. 
This game actually amplifies the trend of blocking projectiles back at enemies which was seen somewhat often previously, so having an unreliable guard for Aqua means that it's usually safer to just dodge projectiles than deal with potentially getting sniped during the guard's ending lag. Some guards also have special properties, like healing you or restoring the focus gauge. Furthermore, every character gets aerial recovery. This works exactly the same as it did in Kingdom Hearts 2, with one glaring, disastrous, insane, infuriating difference. They put it on the square button. Let me demonstrate to you exactly why this is an issue with this clip. You see, in this game, and Kingdom Hearts 2, if you have once more equipped, which keeps you from dying to combos if you were above one hit point when you started getting comboed, it will not allow you to die until you're considered in a recovered state. If an attack knocks you into the air like this, you won't be considered recovered until you either hit the ground or use aerial recovery. In Kingdom Hearts 2, aerial recovery was on the circle button, meaning it was a different button from dodge roll and block. If you got hit by an attack while spamming dodge roll or block, and it knocked you into the air, you couldn't accidentally hit the button to perform aerial recovery and die because it took a deliberate moving of the thumb to the circle button to accomplish this. The exception to this rule was if you were using aerial payback, which launched Sora straight into an attack after a recovery and was on the square button, but that ability sucked so you shouldn't be using it anyway. In Birth by Sleep, it is extremely difficult, nigh nearly impossible, to know in enough time if you are hit during a block or dodge roll spam into the air, and react in enough time to not accidentally re-tap the square button causing you to perform aerial recovery, and then immediately die. In fact, this game has a bad tendency of storing button presses, meaning if you're mashing square and you realize you need to stop because you got knocked into the air, there's a good chance the game will execute on a stored press of the square button and perform aerial recovery for you, causing you to die of no fault of your own. This is insanely stupid, I have no idea how this mistake was made, the blueprint was right there for this team to follow and they just blatantly messed up one of the main defensive options the player has to deal with combos in a game bursting at the proverbial seams with full health to dead combos. We're gonna go over every boss in detail in the next section, but just be prepared for me to use the term full health to dead combos, or FHTD, many, many times throughout the discussion, because there are a shockingly large number of them. This is when a combo is able to take you from full health to completely dead if you even dare getting hit by it at any point during the combo. While my footage is on the hardest difficulty, know that many of these combos are likely more lenient on lower difficulties, but still insanely strong, and the only saving grace against dying to them a hundred times while you learn the fight is to have once more equipped, an issue with its own massive labyrinthine story to tell, which I will delve into momentarily. Actually, let's not do it momentarily, let's explore that labyrinth now, because this is one of the most ridiculous issues I have with the combat of this game. Firstly, let's just briefly go over how you acquire abilities like Second Chance and once more. You level commands by killing enemies while they are equipped. When commands hit max level, you can melt them together to create new ones. If you attach items to these melted commands, they will have a randomly selected ability. Now, before you get mad at me, yes, I know the abilities actually aren't randomly selected. If you meld two fire commands and a fleeting crystal, you will always get magic haste, an ability which decreases recharge time of magic commands. However, in the perspective of anyone playing this game without a guide open or someone giving them tips, these things may as well be random due to the number of possible combinations and the amount of ambiguity present in the system. Out of the literal hundreds of possible combinations here, there are many ways to get each ability, but there is no good way of knowing what ability it will be before you've already melted the commands and wasted the item in question. You could save scum to figure this out, but what are the odds you'll actually be able to figure out the combinations of commands and items you need to create any given ability? You may think I'm asking this question rhetorically, but I'm not. I did the math. I may have even done the monster math, but you'll just have to wait and find out if that's true. There are 297 different melding combinations in the game. Some of them are unique to one or two of the characters, while many are shared by all three. Each of these combinations will give you a certain command in response. Just so we have some examples of what this looks like, some of the most powerful commands only have six ways to meld them. Some commands have quite a bit more, though most are somewhere between three and seven. That doesn't mean there are 297 different abilities to get though, there are actually only 28. There's a pretty easy way to determine what ability a recipe will give you depending on the item attached to it. There are 16 possible patterns, so this FAQ gives each pattern a letter, A through P. Look at this chart. We can see here there are only two patterns which will give you a fire boost ability, A and B, when a shimmering crystal is attached. 
So in order to figure out the likelihood of getting a fire boost, we take the number of A and B patterns present in every melting recipe, divide that by 297, then divide that number further by 7, because that's how many items give a predictable outcome, and without any sort of guide, you basically have to guess at which one of these will give which abilities, meaning it feeds further into the perceived randomness of the system. Even though the items have descriptions that claim to help you determine what abilities come from what, this is not as cut and dry as that sounds. Second chance comes from Pulsing Crystals, the description of which reads that the item gives abilities which increase the damage you deal with certain types of attacks. There's no intuitive way to know second chance would come from that beyond the vague notion that an ability that could protect you from powerful attacks would come from an item which gives you powerful attacks. Once more is the same. It comes from Wellspring Crystals, which gives the abilities which allow you to perform longer combos. Once again, you could say there is a hint in the fact that once more protects you from long combos and the item gives abilities which allow you to perform longer combos. But that's an exceedingly esoteric hint that I would be willing to bet my next Taco Bell order no one has figured out these abilities come from these items just because of that hint. Here you can see that I've counted how many times each pattern emerges. If you add up all of the numbers individually, it should come out to 280, which is 17 less than the total because Shotlock Command recipes can't produce abilities. When I counted every single letter in this list, I came out to 281, so my numbers might be ever so slightly off, but this should at least give us a working idea of how rare certain abilities are. So 280 is our actual working total when determining the perceived randomness of this system. Let's just ignore the fact that every character has a different number of total possible recipes because some characters don't have access to certain commands or have different recipes to make certain commands is what I would say if I wasn't insane. Terra has access to 172, Vin has 174, and Aqua whops them both at 189. This will now be our working number. Except that, because some characters don't have access to certain recipes, this actually completely changes the number of ability patterns they have access to. So, I recounted for each character. I did all of this by hand, so some of my counts are a little off, but only by one digit or so, meaning the final number should be relatively similar to the truth. With all of these numbers calculated, let's find the odds of getting second chance and what's more for each character. Second chance is available with an N and an F pattern. Terra has 16 of those, Vin has 19 of those, and Aqua has 17 of those. So the percentage chance of getting second chance for each character is 9.3% for Terra, 10.9% for Ven, and 9% for Aqua. This is assuming we don't consider the effectively random nature of choosing an item to attach to the recipe. Considering that, the chances go down to 1.4% for Terra, 1.6% for Ven, and 1.3% for Aqua. I think you'd agree that the chance of randomly picking a recipe that results in second chance is pretty low overall, even if you already knew what item gives you the ability that you want. For once more, it's either B or J. Terra has 19, Vin has 13, and Aqua has 20. This makes Terra's chance of randomly getting once more 11%, Vin's 7.5%, and Aqua's 10.6%. Considering randomly selecting the correct item, the chance goes down to 1.6% for Terra, 1.1% for Vin, and 1.5% for Aqua. Again, a pretty low chance overall. If we act like the item you pick is effectively random, then the chance floats a little above 1% for each character. Not taking the item you pick into account, as in we pretend the player already knows which item gives the ability they want, the chance is anywhere from 11% down to 7.5%. So you may be asking, why does all this matter? Why bother crunching all these numbers? Surely there can't be a good reason for doing this. If you're actually asking me those questions internally right now, this is probably your first visit to the channel, and if so, welcome and I hope you enjoy your stay. Here's all the bosses in the game, barring the optional super bosses. You may notice they are color-coded. Green means it's a good boss, yellow means it's a dull, uninteresting boss, red means it's a bad boss, actively assaulting good design principles. You may also notice there aren't any green bosses on there. That's what we in the business call foreshadowing. Next, I'm going to put a check mark next to every boss that has some kind of full health to dead combo, which is impossible to escape if you get hit by even a single hit in the combo and almost guarantees your death depending on difficulty level and stats. Yeah, six of the bosses in this game have a full health to dead combo that they can pull out multiple times during a fight. Also, none of these are desperation moves, meaning they're just regular moves that the boss can cycle into their pattern at basically any time. And this doesn't even include the optional bosses. There are 26 required bosses in this game, though let's say it's actually 25 because Vanitas and Xehanort is just two different bosses slapped haphazardly together. About 24% of the bosses in this game have some kind of full health to dead combo, meaning once more is actually extremely useful, if not borderline required. Just for reference, there weren't a ton of bosses in KH2 that could combo you to death, at least not in the base game. Every single one of the organization members can, but over half of those were added in the final mix re-release. Here's the kicker though, in KH2, 
Once more is an inevitability, not a random chance event. If you picked the shield, you would get it at level 25, well before the bosses that can actually combo you show up. The rod gets it at level 28, again way before the endgame bosses. The sword gets it at level 47, which there is a chance you won't hit by the end of your playthrough, but you can and will get it eventually. So a little farming is all that is standing in your way. You'll also notice that, for every one of these specializations, second chance is far further down the list. This is because the devs knew that combos were more dangerous than individual hits in KH2, and wanted to ensure you got once more as early as balance would allow them. So what about Birth by Sleep? Well, despite the fact that there are now significantly more required bosses that can FHTD you, multiple times during a fight no less, once more is now not inevitable, and in fact, it might never happen for players who don't get lucky with the command melding system. The funny thing is, if you know what you're doing, you can actually get once more extremely early now. I was able to get it before beating Radiant Garden on two of my three playthroughs, and that was without command board farming. If you really wanted to go crazy, you could just use the command board and practically get once more before you even get to the second world. Theoretically, I actually haven't tested this, but I don't see any reason this would be impossible. I'll talk about the command board in the membership video, so if you want to hear about that as well as the other minigames, join my YouTube memberships at the highest tier. However, most players will not know what they are doing, and will be shooting in the dark with the command melding system in order to get the abilities they want. Now some might argue that this is only an issue on the highest difficulty because you're much more likely to survive these combos on lower ones, and people that play on the highest difficulty are probably going to be min-maxing and reading through guides, right? I mean, maybe, but who's to say? I didn't read a guide until I needed once more to get through Terra's final fight because of his insanely difficult patterns, and I had yet to this point needed any sort of guide to get through any of the games at the hardest difficulty, making BBS an outlier. I struggled through Zack 2 and Ericus, but Terranort was the one that broke me, after 34 deaths at his hands. Had I unlocked once more, or any abilities through level ups or scripted events like every other Kingdom Hearts game, this wouldn't have been necessary. Though, I might not have noticed just how dumb most of these bosses are if that had been the case, so maybe I should count myself lucky that this game was designed so absentmindedly. Let's keep going with math-based discussion, getting now into the RPG elements. As I've said before, one of my favorite aspects of the combat system in any action RPG is the damage calculation. Games are computer programs, and programs are just math, which makes video games what math would look like if it went to a masquerade ball. So the structure of your damage calculation actually determines a lot of how fun a game is to play. At first blush, the game's damage calculation is similar to KH2's. If you'll remember, KH2's damage calculation was a simple strength or magic minus defense. It would then modify that number based on the difficulty you're on and other myriad factors. BBS 2 starts its calculation with strength minus defense. Now, this can easily lead to chip damage if the enemy defense outpaces your strength. KH2 got around this by having a damage floor. The base damage for Sora's calculation was always corrected to 8 if it was below 8. It would then be further modified by elemental affinities, the difficulty you're on, and so on, meaning it could be as low as 1, but in most cases, and especially on crit mode where the difficulty modifier actually increased Sora's damage by 25%, this number was higher than 8. This meant you rarely dealt chip damage on crit, regardless of your level, as long as you used attacks that the enemies weren't resistant against. BBS also has a damage floor. 1. It's 1 across the board, likely only because inserting a negative number for damage would either heal the target or crash the game. Note that this lower limit for damage is taken into account after most modifiers, not before. This means that there is a pretty good chance that your attacks will be corrected to 1 if the enemy's defense is larger than your strength stat. Important to note here is that the second part of the damage calculation prior to modifiers is the power of the attack itself. All commands have a power stat attached to them, most often somewhere between 1 and 2, and the result acquired by subtracting base strength from the enemy's defense is multiplied by that value when using abilities with a power stat. This, from what I can tell, can create a weird feedback loop in which an attack that is even one point in the negative after subtracting strength minus defense will actually get weaker by this power stat, because multiplying by a negative number results in a larger negative number. For example, let's say your character has 25 strength and the enemy has 27 defense. That means the initial calculation gives a negative 2. Let's presume the attack you used was Fire Dash, which has a power stat of 1.6 at max level. Negative 2 times 1.6 gives negative 3.2, which is less, even though the power multiplication is supposed to make stronger commands, you know, stronger than your melee attacks. This results in the opposite. There's a pretty simple way around this. Instead of multiplying the result of strength minus defense by the power stat, you could multiply the power stat by the battle level of the world and then add that to the calculation rather than multiply. 
Let's take the same example. 25 strength minus 27 defense gives a negative 2. Let's say the battle level was 5. 1.6 times 5 is 8. Then we add negative 2 to 8 and we get a base damage of 6. This would still give very powerful attacks some more potency without ensuring they actually make you weaker if you happen to have a strength stat that is even one point lower than the enemy's defense. What this system results in is basically a guarantee that if your strength is even one measly point below the enemy's defense, you will do chip damage without fail. Let me keep explaining the damage calculation and maybe it'll make more sense why this is important. After the initial calculation is when the damage is modified potentially upward. There are only a few abilities in which this can possibly happen. Fire up, blizzard up, thunder up, combo F up, and command F up. Each of these increases their respective attack values by 10%. This would presumably just add 10% of the absolute value of a negative number. So if an attack calculated out to negative 10, it would increase by one, meaning your attack would be negative nine instead. Notably, since it's based on percentages, there's no way for this calculation to get your attack value above one, if it was already below one. Stitch and Donald's D-Links have an ability that increases your physical and magic damage by 1.5 respectively. This, again, would simply result in a larger negative number if the calculation was negative. Finally, Terra's D-Link has an ability where if you are below 25% HP, your attacks deal 2 times damage, once again resulting in a lower negative number rather than giving you any benefit if your initial calculation was negative. It is only after this point that damage is corrected to 1 if lower than 1. Before I analyze this fact a bit more, I'd like to mention that there are, after this correction, still modifiers which can increase or even reduce your damage further. If the attack is a critical hit, it increases based on the critical hit modifier of the individual keyblade you were using. Elemental affinity is then taken into account, which can either increase or decrease damage depending on the case. Game difficulty will also modify your damage, though only beginner mode actually changes anything, the rest have a damage modifier of 1.0 for outgoing damage. Finally, Donald and Goofy's D-Links have abilities which reduce elemental damage or physical damage by 0.5 times the original respectively. If, after all this, damage is below 1, as in the damage was 1 and then it was multiplied by 0.5 making the damage 0.5, damage just won't be dealt. Presumably this would only happen if you're using an attack that the enemy is strong against, like fire on a fire-based enemy, but it is still possible. Before I lay out how I would fix this, I just want to drill home. Using a massive hammering drill and a masonry drill bit, how wild it is that this damage calculation can result in giving you enormously negative numbers if your strength is even one point under the enemy's defense. This is, I would say, objectively broken. Damage calculations should not do this. This is blatantly punishing the player if they even dare to be just a few levels below what the developers deemed a good level for each world. So I think we can all agree that, for an action RPG, a genre that is focused around player skill, allowing the player to deal literally no damage is a bit of a rough call. There's actually an even easier way to fix this than the one I presented before, though it would result in lower values potentially. Just correct the damage to 1 before anything else. Let me show you two full calculations so you can see what I mean. Let's lay out some parameters. Let's say we're on critical mode which has an outgoing damage modifier of 1, there's no elemental affinity changes, and we have command F up which increases damage from commands by 10%. Let's say we have 25 strength and the enemy has 27 defense, so we get a negative 2 damage. Then we use Strike Raid to attack, which at max level has a power stat of 1.5. Negative 2 times 1.5 is negative 3. Command F up then takes effect, so 10% of negative 3 is negative 0.3, meaning our new value would be negative 2.7. Damage is, at this point, corrected to 1, so none of that calculation mattered. Finally, damage is affected by the difficulty mode you're on, but since crit's outgoing damage modifier is 1, there is no change, meaning our final damage is 1. Chip damage, all day, every day. Now let's do the same calculation, except we correct the damage after the initial calculation before the modifiers. Same numbers, so 25 minus 27 is negative 2, then we correct to 1 because it's lower than 1. We get 1.5 as our value after multiplying strike rate's power stat, and command F up gives us another 10%, meaning we are at 1.65. Presuming the game rounds up to the nearest whole number, we would be at 2 damage rather than 1 by the end of the calculation. More powerful attacks like Zantetsuken or the Mine family of commands would benefit from this even more because of their large power stat. This would ensure that you're never dealing just one damage, though the difference at extremely low amounts like this is negligible. It would also give more value to carefully picking elemental attacks in order to make use of the elemental modifier, which could increase the damage even more. The difference between one damage and two damage is almost nothing, but the difference between one damage and five damage is actually significant in a game like this, especially when attacks like Mind Square can hit numerous times. 
Or, you know, you could take it even a step further than that and just make the damage floor, say, I don't know, eight, on top of making it the first thing that happens after the strength minus defense if that number is lower than eight. Yeah, I think that would work. Wanna know why? Because that's literally what Kingdom Hearts 2 did, and that game has thus far had the best level one experience of any of them. Speaking of that, the zero EXP ability present in this game actually proves my point. If you'll remember, KH1's EXP0 ability made enemies deal your HP minus one, and your damage was corrected for bosses. These modifiers were necessary because that game was very stats dependent, and chip damage could occur if you didn't level up enough, though it was never quite that intense. In my hardest mode playthrough I wasn't doing chip damage at any point, but I was underleveled around the time I hit Giant Ursula, making that boss a slog. KH2's EXP0 ability didn't need modifiers like this because the game was balanced from the beginning so that stats weren't as important as skill. If it's possible to beat the game without any upgrades to stats and without any modifiers like those present in KH1's EXP0 ability, then the game is properly balanced around skill taking precedence over stats. Those stats can still give players struggling with the game a leg up. While you could theoretically beat KH1 at level 1 without those modifiers, it would take ages of literally perfect gameplay where you never take a hit and have to strike a thousand times or more per boss. Now, BBS's 0 EXP ability also has modifiers. Funnily enough, according to some tests ran by Ereticent Horizon on Reddit, 0 EXP only changes the damage floor for all attacks. Basic attacks have a minimum damage of 4 for battle levels, 1 through 4, and 5 for battle levels 5 and up. Commands have a minimum damage of 9 for battle levels 1 through 4, and 10 for 5 and up. This damage floor, unlike the one built into the game from the start, is the last part of the calculation rather than being in the middle. So in designing 0 EXP this way, the devs acknowledge that a decently high damage floor is important for keeping a game entertaining at low levels. So why is this only available when 0 EXP is activated? Why not just set a similar parameter for any other time in the game so you can't just do chip damage? If they can acknowledge that chip damage is unfun at level 1, then why would they not acknowledge chip damage would be unfun at any other level too? So I'm making a big fuss about this, and you may be thinking, why is this a big deal? If you stay at a decent level, it's not an issue, right? And yeah, that's fair, but here's the thing, there's even issues with how the game expects you to level. The battle level system makes a return from the previous games, in which the battle level of the world determines the enemy's stats. It's a little more similar to the system from KH1, in which the battle level was represented by esoteric stars that only tell you how tough the world is in relation to others. In KH2, the battle level also told you what level was recommended for Sora, so it was easy to tell if you were underleveled. Which is ironic, because being underleveled doesn't matter all that much in KH2, but still. BBS gives each world a battle level between 1 and 9. The first three worlds you go to will be 1 through 3, Radiant Garden is 4, and it keeps increasing incrementally for each world after that. Here's the first three worlds in the chart for each character. You can see that the battle level determines the HP, attack, defense, and XP for the enemies and bosses they're in. For HP and XP, those values are multiplied by the individual enemies' health and XP values to get their operating value. This is the same as KH2. Now an anecdote. In two of my three playthroughs, specifically Vin and Aqua, I found myself getting to deep space, specifically, and doing basically no damage to even regular fodder enemies. This problem continued when I got to Neverland and I was forced to go farm levels or face atricious battles. This was weird, and I had a feeling there was some weird math stuff going on behind the scenes, but I decided to just move on and look into it later. I went and farmed a chunk of levels, did some Mirage Arena and treasure hunting, and by the time I came back I was much better off. Now here's the chart again. You'll notice that, for the first three worlds, the defense value only goes up by one point from three to four. Now let's add Radiant Garden into the mix. Here, the defense value goes up by two in a single world. Not really an issue yet. Let's add the next battle level. This one's for Disney Town and Olympus Coliseum. And you'll notice that the defense value has gone up by three points in a single battle level. I would like to now point out that both of these worlds are light on combat. Disney Town is mostly for minigames. While there are plenty of places to go for combat, there are off the beaten path for the stories that take place there, which consist of a single minigame and a couple cutscenes before moving on, so it's easy to do this whole world with no level ups. Olympus Coliseum is similar, it's light on combat, with only a few scripted fights and a focus on bosses generally. It's reasonable to get through both Disney Town and Olympus Coliseum only gaining a couple levels. If you look at the level up chart for Aqua, you can see it takes on average two levels to get another point in strength or magic. Now let's see the next battle level. There's the culprit. 
Over the course of two worlds in which it's reasonable to get less than four levels, you're expected to gain three points in strength and magic. And that's just not likely without going out of your way to level farm, and I think both of my playthroughs show that. In these games, I fight every optional fight I come across while making my way through the game, but rarely seek out any extra fighting beyond that. Is it my fault I was underleveled and had to go find some experience? Or is it the devs fault for not balancing the game around not needing to level farm, or just implementing a damage floor that's worth anything? And don't think I'm unfairly critiquing the game, I said basically the same stuff in the KH1 video. This is a point I'm not willing to budge on. Action RPGs should always allow skill to trump the need for stats because it's, you know, an action RPG. If you want a game that demands you be certain levels, you should play a turn-based game where the skill comes from preparation and strategy over moment-to-moment -moment action. Actually, you can beat Final Fantasy XIII without ever leveling up the characters, did you know that? So maybe what I should be saying is that no game should require you to be at a certain level at any point, stats are stupid and boring and encourage boring and repetitive playstyles. They're good for those that need the extrinsic motivation of progressively growing stronger in-game, but they are ultimately a negative inclusion if you are required to spend any amount of time insipidly fighting the same enemies over and over again just to stand a chance against enemies in the zone you actually want to be in, because the devs arbitrarily decided you shouldn't be able to move on until you hit a milestone they determined is appropriate. Everything in video games is arbitrary, but soft stat requirements like this are arbitrary in an annoying and unfun way, and an arbitration that these devs themselves quietly admitted doesn't work when they were forced to account for their own negligence in the way they designed Zero EXP. Wow, that's got to be the longest paragraph I've ever written. Briefly, I want to discuss difficulty levels because they're important as they always have been. This one has beginner, standard, proud, and critical. Beginner has damage output at 1.5 times, while Standard, Proud, and Critical all have damage output at 1.0. For damage receiving, Beginner has 0.5, Standard has 1.0, Proud and Critical both have 2.0. Critical also reduces incoming EXP to 75% of the normal amount, and max HP is halved. You start with 5 command slots instead of 3, though the game doesn't have the decency to fill them with anything but dry air at the start of the game. KH2's critical mode is by far the best way to play because it increases your damage compared to the two difficulties below it. Incoming damage is set to an actually threatening amount, and they give you a bunch of abilities right from the start to make your moveset more interesting from the get-go. BBS tried a facsimile of this, but it didn't really succeed. They also don't increase your damage in relation to lower difficulty levels, though I'm not sure doing so would have even mattered because of the aforementioned issues with the leveling system, battle levels, and the damage calculation, three overlapping systems so pockmarked with issues that they look like an acne scarred Venn diagram. EXP gains being reduced to 75% makes me wonder if they were copying KH2's homework without understanding why that was an okay choice to make in KH2. Back then, it meant that being overleveled on crit mode was next to impossible without a lot of grinding, which was okay because being underleveled didn't matter on crit mode. As I've already shown, this is far, far, far from the case in Birth by Sleep, and being underleveled is an enormous pain, so why not just leave EXP gains alone? While I can't test build something like this myself, I can't imagine it would significantly change the difficulty of crit mode at all. It would only ensure you don't get underleveled, that the level balancing from the lower difficulties is maintained. Let's move on to something a little more esoteric and less... mathy. The feel of the game. A lot, and I do mean a lot of people use the term floaty when they refer to this game's feel, and they're right. A lot of people disagree, though I get the distinct feeling that some people don't really understand what we mean by floaty. Here's some footage from Kingdom Hearts 2. When I'm performing an air combo, it's easy to stay in the air and continue the air combo for as long as I want. Then, once the combo is over, Sora starts toward the ground and hits it pretty much immediately, though this will depend on your finisher. The aerial spiral finisher hangs Sora in the air for much longer, whereas the standard air combo finisher actually propels him downward, quickly magnetizing to the ground and allowing the player to move into a ground combo, a dodge, a block, or another air combo after a quick hop. If this element of Aerial Spiral bothered you, you could always just leave it unequipped. Now here's some similar footage in Birth by Sleep. Here's some footage of completing an air dash. Look at how long it takes Terra to start falling to the ground here. There's a good chunk of frames where not only is no downward momentum happening, no momentum is happening at all. I've reached the game feel equivalent of a 5 car pileup. Here's some footage of a command style air combo. Again, look how long it takes for the character to start falling to the ground, or start doing anything for that matter. Aqua is the only character that can guard in the air in this game, look at how long it takes for her to fall. Look at her double flight ability. Look at these commands that can be used in the air. 
What every single one of these examples share is that it takes a weirdly long amount of time for momentum to start building again, and it translates into feeling like it's difficult to get out of the air, like it's floaty. In these games, being in the air for a long period of time is the most dangerous place you can be during most bosses due to a lack of defensive options, and Birth by Sleep is no exception. Every character has air slide now, which is good in concept, but like I showed, its ending lag is so abysmally slow that it's just as likely to get you killed as anything else. Ditto for Aqua's Double Flight and In-Air Guard. It's this lack of snappiness, consistent momentum, and fluidity that most people leveraging the term floaty are taking offense to. And here's the thing, you can enjoy how this game feels, I'm not telling you you can't, but it is mathematically different from its predecessors, and there's no ignoring that. Whether you like it is up to your opinion. I think it feels horrible, so I typically pick my command deck so that I don't have to go into the air much at all, which is a shame because aerial combat is a toolset that I'm just not using much in this game because it feels awful and is overly dangerous, but here we are. It took me sitting down to write this script to realize that this game doesn't have parries anymore. I've gone on record as saying the parry system, where your physical attacks and the attacks of the enemy or boss clash and cause you to both bounce off resulting in no damage to you or the boss, is probably the main reason these games can have such high paced bosses while still being fair and fun. It was a primary gameplay mechanic in Kingdom Hearts 1, and it was still important for a lot of fights in Kingdom Hearts 2. It's been in the series since the beginning. Yeah, Birth by Sleep just doesn't have that. Period. If you attack at the same time as a boss, you will get bodied 100% of the time. The only way to parry an enemy attack is to use the block ability, but even then, I have literally a hundred clips of bosses just not staggering from this, ignoring my block as if nothing happened. Meaning blocks don't even technically work like parries used to anymore, which they also always did before. Counterattacks are now, in my experience, the only way to knock an enemy out of an attack pattern besides certain commands, but this is inconsistent at best. I can't understate the importance of this change and how much it affects the combat, especially against bosses, and you'll see the fruits of this change in the next section when we talk about the bosses in order. Oh yeah, the camera too. This game's camera is very close to your back, and this time I scoured the button layout and options to see if there was an option to pull it out, and there isn't. KH1 had a similar angle and spacing for the camera, whereas KH2 pulled it out much further to allow you to see more of the battlefield at once. These games involve many fights with a cavalcade of enemies, enormous bosses, and bosses that can move quickly. This, for the most part, is a matter of opinion, but I do think that having the camera this close is ultimately a detriment, as it means less peripheral, and your character also takes up a much larger portion of the screen. In fact, I had a glitch happen in which the camera pulled itself way out for a short time, and man, doesn't this just look way better? But alas, the glitch ended eventually, and thus my dream shattered and I was returned to reality. Beyond all of this, this combat continues to fail by what I would call a death by a thousand cuts. So many small changes, additions, or subtractions amount to a massive difference in how this one feels to play, as well as the balance and viability of certain moves. Aerial recovery on square? This significantly reduces the value of aerial recovery, making combat less snappy because you can't reliably use it to recover from attacks that knock you in the air. Style changes lock you in place without your consent? This has actually gotten me killed on at least two occasions, not to mention the fact that it halts the flow of combat every 10 to 15 seconds to an absolute standstill, again, without your consent. Command styles ending dropping all inputs besides movement? This has gotten me killed too when the game drops my dodge roll because my command style ended. Inconsistency between defensive options on characters? Terra feels like a tank to control in all of the worst ways possible, and for a game series that has always had a focus on fluidity and agility in its combat, this is a questionable decision. On the opposite side of this coin, Aqua and Ven both have a dodge roll that is spammable to the point that bosses have no recourse if you just keep pressing square indefinitely. Many commands take too long to complete, making you extremely vulnerable. Commands are a mixed bag, and given the kind of combat the bosses present you with most of the time, it pushes the player to choose the boring but safe options in most cases, despite some neat commands that fill out the too cool to use bracket. Almost every new addition to the combat is completely broken. Shot locks especially are busted. They can be used many times per fight, deal a bunch of damage to many or single targets, and keep you completely safe for the duration, and your commands recharge in the background. Dealings have some insanely powerful finishers that can absolutely destroy bosses even at level 1. Even the commands aren't immune to this, for the most part they are now so powerful and so much safer overall that they completely overtake physical combos in terms of importance in the combat, which I would argue has been the primary focus of the combat since the beginning, with magic at a close second. 
With all that said, I have to lay out a big ol' omelet sized however here. It has become incredibly apparent to me with this game that there's an aspect of the series I've been completely ignoring. In an interview, Nomura says, quote, There really are all sorts of conditions that change commands, and you can connect them to the D-Link system that we haven't released much information about yet. Kingdom Hearts doesn't really aim for difficult action. There are a lot of users who play by mashing the same button. That's what this is based on. Things won't get boring if you mash the same button. It's a system that changes to stay fun. You can use a command with just one button, and even playing simply, it's an action game where you can enjoy a wealth of variety. There are plenty of people that just want the combat of these games to be simple, easy to understand, requiring little more than pressing X and occasionally triangle to do some special attack. If you play this way, this is bar none the most interesting game so far. The power of commands will push you toward using them, and then you'll end up style changing into some sort of powerful, flashy form that fits with the type of commands you like to use. Your physical attacks get bigger, stronger, and more interesting to look at, and if you keep going with commands, you might even shift into yet another command style, further increasing the spectacle of your physical attacks and your finishers, making you much stronger still. Compared to KH1, this is far more interesting to play and watch. Compared to KH2, the gap is a bit smaller, but still pretty massive. This game is an impressive achievement viewed from this lens, especially considering its original release on the PSP. I can't in good faith say this is a bad thing. I'm not the sole audience for this series. I may not even be the target demographic at all if this quote is anything to go by. I do have two problems with it though. Keep in mind as I do this that Japanese is a tricky language to translate. Firstly, he says Kingdom Hearts doesn't really aim for difficult action. If this was truly the case, why would there be difficulty levels at all? And why would Sephiroth exist? Clearly, at least part of the design of the games is aimed at people who want more than a button matcher. Secondly, here's the rest of the paragraph. Quote, the only thing is that by incorporating too much of this new system, the three protagonists are too strong and the importance of tricks to defeat bosses has faded a bit. We're going to work on balancing that out. So balance was a concern for them to some degree. They wanted bosses to at least be partially a challenge. With that in mind, here's a thought. Casual players, on lower difficulties, can and will enjoy a boss regardless of design consistency. They don't care if a boss is designed well or bad, they just want to be able to get past it and maybe have some fun doing so. Lower difficulties and broken mechanics allow them to do this. Hardcore players, as Nomura puts it in a different interview, however, can't enjoy a bad boss. They play on higher difficulties, often avoid using broken mechanics, and notice when things are improperly tuned or bosses are using unfair tactics. So why wouldn't you aim to design your bosses such that hardcore players can enjoy them? As long as you don't design any of the required bosses to be too difficult overall on lower difficulties, this would allow both casual and hardcore players to enjoy the bosses all the same. I recognize this is much easier said than done. Hardcore players' favorite bosses in this series, Riku from Kingdom Hearts 1 or perhaps Roxas from Kingdom Hearts 2, are usually what TV tropes would call brick wall bosses, and casual players struggle with them, even on lower difficulties. There's not an easy solution to this, but a balance needs to be struck. After saying all this though, I'm not so sure that this was the problem with Birth by Sleep. There's such a blatant lack of competence in the boss design in this game that I'm not sure they even got to the stage of considering whether the bosses would be fun for casuals, hardcores, or both. Since I just said something extremely blasphemous against the devs of this game, I think it's high time I started supporting my statements in regards to the boss design on display here. I'm going to go over every boss in the game, first explaining their strengths and weaknesses, then talking about my deaths to each one if they're somehow relevant. I'm going to start with each character individually, followed by the bosses shared by two or more of the characters, of which there are quite a few. But first I want to go back to this chart and explain a little more about my distinction between good, middling, and bad bosses. A meh boss isn't good or bad. It's usually just dull. Perhaps their attacks aren't interesting to deal with, or maybe they just don't do much at all. Fighting these bosses can be fun, but that's different from being good. As for bad bosses, in every case these bosses exhibit some sort of quality in the boss design that is negative and makes the boss ultimately bad to fight. Once again, these bosses can still be fun, but that once again is different from being good. Without certain mechanics, these bosses could easily be bumped up into the middle in category, though in order for any of these bosses to be bumped up to good, we'd likely need to see a reworking of the boss on the whole, or perhaps even the entire combat system. With that said, let's start at the beginning of Terra Story and work from there, skipping over the shared bosses for now. Also, I'm only considering a boss shared if fighting them is required to complete the story. 
Some of these bosses actually repeat in the Mirage Arena, but this isn't required to finish the game, so I'm not counting those instances. Terra starts with the Wheelmaster. This guy is innocuous. He just jumps around and then picks from one of three attacks. You can destroy the arms that do each attack in order to remove them from the fight. The attack where he throws the wheel is pretty janky because you can't actually see the wheel if you're within melee range of him, making it difficult to see coming. Not really a problem on repeat attempts though, so it's not a big deal. This was the source of my only death though. Mostly, he's just boring. Next is the Symphony Master. Again, he just hops around the arena and picks from one of three attacks, and again, you can destroy the instruments to remove their attacks from the battle. He can also use all three at once to surround you and attack periodically. He has a lot of time in which attacking is overly dangerous, so waiting around is common and boring. Also, the Baton Toss attack has some serious visual feedback issues. Also, I managed to dodge it without moving once, so it's got some questionable deadliness as well. Again, not bad, just boring mostly. Both of my deaths here were my fault and uninteresting. Terra's next unique boss is a rematch with Zack, in which he gets one doozy of an attack. Check this thing out. Would you believe this attack is completely unblockable? It is dodgeable, but the timing is extremely strict, thanks in no small part to the fact that Terra's dodge has a massive delay on the end of it in which you are completely vulnerable. Ultimately, the boss will likely turn into a shot lock fest if you don't have once more equipped by this point, which I think I've already shown is at least somewhat unlikely just due to random chance. Shot locks last just long enough to get you through this attack without taking a hit, depending on how quick you are on the draw. Oh yeah, and he can use the attack numerous times during the fight. In my winning attempt, he used it four times. Luckily, the rest of his attacks are innocuous and allow you time to recover and deal some damage before he inevitably uses the attack again. A couple of my 15 deaths here emphasize the fact that parries are gone entirely. A couple times I started an attack at the same time as the boss and ended up getting bodied. In another KH game, this might have ended in a parry and effectively a neutral outcome, but in this game, it was a death. I counted these deaths as my fault entirely because it's not the fault of the game that I was playing it like any other KH game, but it does make me wonder why parries are gone to begin with. Experiment 221 is next and this guy is extremely boring. Lots of downtime between attacks and he gets knocked an annoying distance away from any finisher so chaining attacks is more difficult than it should be. There's also some visual inconsistencies in what attacks can and can't be blocked. You can block these little lightning balls that he sends out, and in fact, doing so deals quite a bit of damage. But this big lightning ball, no no. Even though it just looks like a bigger version of the exact same projectile, no sir, you can't block this one. Throughout the game, I'd say that inconsistent blockability in the attacks is an issue, actually. Attacks that seem blockable sometimes just aren't, and will punch through your defense. I don't remember this being an issue in past games. Attacks that weren't blockable always seemed obvious due to usually being magical in nature, or the attack coming at Sora from some direction other than straight on. In this one, the rules are just kind of non-existent for these things, so trying to block an attack is a bit of a crapshoot. Peter Pan splits Terra's trip to Neverland in half, and he's not really a boss and didn't actually attack me during my fight with him because I just kept staggering him over and over again. So let's just move past him to the second doozy of a boss in Terra's story, Ericus. I'm just gonna throw a number out there, and you try and guess how it relates to the following clip. The number is 4. Now, here's the clip. Specifically what I was referring to is that there were 4 frames between his animation starting and Terra taking damage, and this, my friends, is yet another full health to dead combo. 4 frames. This puts Sephiroth from KH1 to absolute shame. Ericus is never going to get a girlfriend with speeds like that. This doesn't happen every time he uses this attack because of the way he pivots toward the player. When Sephiroth started an attack, he would snap into place in the space of a couple frames before damage zones became active. Ericus, on the other hand, pivots toward the player after damage zones have become active, meaning he can catch you with the damage zone on his opening swing before it even really starts. I think it would be fair to call this a bad hitbox, but it's also an animation issue. The hitbox shouldn't be active before he's even swung the Keyblade. It is possible to break out of this one by mashing the dodge button, but generally this combo is a death sentence on higher difficulty. If only that combo was the only issue with this boss. Unfortunately, he can also do this. This is a block and retaliation move, which I'll remind you was introduced in Kingdom Hearts 1 as early as the first fight with Riku, but most prominently in his rematch at Hollow Bastion. In that game, there was a grace period between the block starting and it triggering a retaliation if hit. In Birth by Sleep, Ericus can choose after you've started an attack if he wants to block your move and can then immediately retaliate and deal damage. 
And as you just saw, he did that twice in a row. There's no rhyme or reason to this, so never commit yourself to an attack that is anything more than the bare minimum in terms of commitment, lest he choose to block and deal damage to you. What's particularly funny in a cosmic and depressing sort of way is that this is similar to what we could do to bosses in Kingdom Hearts 1, like in this clip I showed of me using the metal chocobo against Riku. Does that mean we're the villains here and Ericus is the real main character? Jokes aside, this boss exhibits so many issues present in most of the hardest bosses in the game, which we'll see plenty more of. Also, his DMs are an absolute joke. Neither of them are even slightly dangerous, and they wear their lameness on their sleeve. Look at this one. He slowly pivots the beams about 45 degrees before ending the attack, as if he got three words into a really good sentence before realizing he didn't know where he was going with it and just kind of stopped. Most of my deaths here were from stupid crap like him retaliating twice or hitting me after providing basically no telegraph to his attacks. The next boss, Xehanort and Vanitas, is technically unique to Terra, but it's just two bosses slapped together, so I'm gonna skip over it. That brings us to Xehanort himself, all by his lonesome. Honestly, he's kinda boring. One annoying thing he can do is warp straight to you and start attacking out of nowhere, although this is more of a problem in the joint boss with Vanitas before this. He's a bit too easy to stagger, though I guess I can understand it if this was a story integration moment because you're literally fighting an old man. Terranort, however, is far from boring. He's terrible. Firstly, check out this beautiful full health to dead combo. Ah, so good. He actually gets a second one toward the end of the fight, can you believe it? This one isn't quite as bad actually, but it's still pretty gross. A pretty massive issue with this fight is inconsistent staggering. Blocking and counter-attacking yields unpredictable results, as I showed previously. The hitbox lag on the rock slam attack is almost comical, it's so bad. It can still damage you well after the rocks have already disappeared. His DM is kind of lame, especially when these meteors can appear underneath you with no warning. Yeah, you've gotta stay moving, not a big deal, just annoying needlessly. There's almost no redeeming qualities to this boss, though I do enjoy that Terranort uses some of the same moves you have access to, like the rock slam attack, meteor, and his dark volley shot lock. Many, many of my deaths here were from him not staggering to a counterattack and immediately going into an FHTP combo, and one time he actually broke clean through my guard. This is the boss that basically forced me to go get once more in second chance before I could beat it without being insanely patient. Next up, we've got Vin, starting with the Mad Treant. Not much to say here, really. He attacks slowly and doesn't do much when he does. After him is the adorable Lucifer, with a bunch of attacks that have almost no telegraph. A lot of Vin's bosses have some sort of gimmick that allows you to deal a bunch of damage at once, and for Lucifer, you must perform a very slow rhythm game in order to ride him around for a while before slamming him into something, dealing damage. Again, stuff like this serves the casual market well, keeping bosses interesting and periodically switching things up, but for the market I'm in, this is kinda lame. It goes by quickly though, so it's not a big deal. Now we fight Maleficent, and I love when there's a rematch boss in these games because I can draw direct comparisons. Here's some footage of Maleficent in Kingdom Hearts 1. You'll notice that there are a lot of things going on. You have to deal with her floating platform, the mob she spawns, and her own attacks, and depending on how well you do with that, the boss can end up taking much longer. Now, here's Maleficent from Birth by Sleep. She attacks very slowly, they're easy to dodge, and her main attack just allows you to perform another rhythm game gimmick to deal some free damage before going back into the boring phase. I would call this less than engaging to be sure. We're going to skip over Vanitas for now and go to Metamorphosis. Again, the top of my notes cell for this boss just says BORING OMG in all caps. This fight is dull to play and dull to take notes on, too. This is probably the derpiest, glitchiest boss we've come across in this series. His dash attack just looks wrong. It does not look like it belongs in the series that has been hitherto some of the most polished experiences on the market. The spinning attack just doesn't work properly. If you stand still, you can actually dodge it pretty easily if you're underneath him. Boring, boring, boring. Next we have Captain Hook. He actually has a lot in common with his KH1 counterpart, except they failed to design it as well as in that game. There was one attack he had back then that had literally zero telegraph, but it always came in a group of three with a forced stun period afterward, and it always started with him getting real angry and stopping around for a second. This meant you knew it was coming and could reliably retaliate against it, even without the guard ability equipped. Hook has very similar attacks in this game but without the smart pattern design, meaning they can't be predicted. Hook can also randomly choose to block and potentially retaliate against your attacks, similar to Ericus though it isn't quite as egregious perhaps. I have this section in my notes for this boss which I think I'm just gonna read verbatim. I've essentially said this earlier but I think it lays out the issue pretty clearly here. 
The problem with the parry attacks in this game is that almost none of them happen with any warning. Upon taking damage, the boss will have a chance to decide to block and retaliate, rather than it being a state that the boss enters into with some telegraph leeway. If the attack you were using which triggers the parry attack has multiple hit registration, it'll trigger the repost. This happens with no potential for recourse on the part of the player. Recoded got this right in the future, and KH1 and 2 both got this right in the past. Vanitas 4 is technically a unique boss for Ven, but I'm going to discuss all forms of Vanitas later, meaning we've already moved on to Aqua. She starts out with a fight against the Cursed Coach, and this one is similar to the Mad Treant in the sense that it's just dull and boring. The Cursed Coach barely attacks at all, and it just feels very slow. Next, and with decently more substance, is Maleficent Dragon. I find her opening attack funny because it bathes the entire front of the arena in green fire. In my playthrough, this killed me instantly. I tried blocking it, jumping over it, neither of which worked obviously. Then I just ran behind her and found the easiest strat for the boss out of necessity. You can stand back here and pepper the dragon with attacks extremely easily and she has little she can do about it. Later you can use a quick time event to get on her back as she flies around and the fight is basically over at this point. I just love that the boss is designed in such a way to point you to the easiest and least interesting way to beat it right from the get go. Aqua then fights Hades and the Ice Titan at the same time. Don't worry, it's not nearly as hard as it sounds. One very strange element of this is that the Ice Titan still shoots icicles at the player, but when you block them, they don't get returned back like they did in KH1, which was like the only feasible way to deal damage back then. Not only that, but he will just loop through the same attack over and over if you let him. Considering returning volleys of projectiles with guards is a common thing in this game, this just strikes as exceptionally strange. This time you're meant to attack his feet, getting behind him will cause him to just shift his weight around, meaning you can essentially loop him into extremely predictable patterns and whittle him down. Once his HP is gone, he's out of the fight, leaving Hades, who is an absolute joke. He's super easy to stagger and doesn't do much of interest for the duration of the fight. He has some attacks that make him invincible, but this just prolongs the inevitable, making this a boring fight on top of it being too easy. Gantu finishes out Deep Space and he has only a few attacks from what I can tell, most of which aren't even directed at the player, just at a vague bubble around Gantu. I don't mean these are AoE attacks, I mean they are Gantu wildly shooting bullets in the air at random locations just sort of hoping he hits Aqua. He will occasionally charge at you, which is a directed attack, but too little too sparsely for me. He actually spent a bunch of time in my winning attempt just sort of walking around. Very strange boss, very strange design. Her fight against Terranort and his guardian has all the same problems as Terranort but adds some more dumb stuff. Firstly, just look at this clip. I'm going to explain later what's happening here, just keep it in mind. It also just looks really dumb so I thought I'd show it. Anyway, my first and biggest issue with this boss is that the attacks are non-threatening. Certain attack patterns end up being more of an opportunity than a threat his DM being perhaps the best example. It's similar to the DM present in the second fight with Ansem in Kingdom Hearts 1, except in this one you've got an infinite eye frame dodge so there's no chance of taking damage. What's more, I found this really cheesy strat where, right before it starts, I would put down a bunch of mines and then roll into Terranort while the DM was playing out, pushing him into the mines in an overly comical way. It's wild to me that he not only stays vulnerable during this attack, but also can be shoved around with your dodge rolls during it. I guess this is a creative use of the game mechanics, but DMs are supposed to be dangerous and deadly, not the best time to rack up some damage. My other issue here is that he can, in retaliation against certain attacks or actions, choose to rush at you at intense speeds and use this FHTD combo in a way that can feel unfair, even if it technically isn't. This mechanic is actually the only source for both of my deaths, and it happened while I was casting Cure both times, so I was just done for. Finally, in the secret episode, we have Darkhide, who will look familiar to anyone that's played Kingdom Hearts 2. I'm not exactly sure why this guy makes an appearance in the Realm of Darkness many, many years before his appearance in Kingdom Hearts 2, but whatever. The opening phase just sees him jumping out of bounds and then using a certain attack on you. It'll always go into first person mode, and using the way the camera moves as a sort of telegraph, you can easily determine what response you should use well before the attack shows up. After a while, he'll go into phase 2, where his hitboxes become insane and he jumps around the arena like crazy, becoming very disorienting to fight. You'll likely recognize some of these attacks from Kingdom Hearts 2 as well. This phase gets wild, but the third phase is actually much easier. His attacks suddenly start being aimed at where you were rather than where you are if you keep moving, so he's much easier to dodge and becomes a good bit more predictable to boot. I wouldn't call this one bad, some of his patterns are just poorly implemented and he's a bit too big for the camera. Alright, now for the bosses that are shared, starting from the most innocuous and going from there. Magic Mirror appears in the same spot in both Terra's and Aqua's stories. 
There is no difference between their fights, and it honestly doesn't even make sense for Aqua to have to fight him because Terra already did, but whatever. He mostly just copies himself and you have to find the correct one and do damage to him in order to push the phase, else he'll shoot a bunch of projectiles at you from all different angles. When you get to this tunnel attack, I think the game just wants you to move forward until it ends, though I could be wrong about this. That's how I dealt with it both times. Sometimes he'll sort of rush at you like this, overall I just find this one boring and uninteresting. Again, not enough attacks, too many of them are too vague to be threatening in any real way. Briefly, I'm going to mention Zack 1 just to say that he's a less complicated version of his second fight with Terra. Next, we have Trinity Armor. This boss has a somewhat similar structure to the opposite armor fight from Kingdom Hearts 1. There are three separate health bars, arms, legs, and a torso, and each must be taken out to beat the fight. Each can perform their own attacks when separated from the body, though they don't do this concurrently usually. They actually take turns attacking most of the time during this phase unless they choose to do this spinning attack. When they are acting as one unit, they launch projectiles in the air which rain down, then out across the arena. They can rush at you three times in a row. They will also go to the center of the arena and shoot a big laser, spinning around to cover the whole stage. When there's only two pieces left, they will often connect to each other with a beam of electricity and then fly around in a circle, though this is rarely dangerous. While I don't think this boss is bad, the main problem with it is that the attacks take too long to complete, making the boss feel like a drag. It also plainly shows why there are no NPC companions in this game. If there were, this is what they'd be doing 90% of the time. This boss is also another way we can see the problem of attack disparity present in most of this game, which I brought up briefly with Terranort and Guardian. Basically, attack disparity is when some attacks are seen less as actual threats and more as opportunities to deal damage. Just about every boss needs to have attacks which provide opportunities to stagger or deal damage, but many attacks in this game fail to be threatening when that is clearly their purpose. Take the spinning laser attack from Trinity Armor. It is so incredibly easy to dodge that this attack comes off as a breather rather than an actual attack. Terranort and Guardian's DM is this way as well, where it's so easy to dodge that I found myself finding sneaky ways to get in extra damage during it. While there's nothing wrong with designing attacks this way, and in fact I've highly encouraged it in the past, the attack still needs to be threatening. Take Hollow Knight as an example. Nightmare King Grimm is relentless and barely ever gives you an opportunity to just wail on him. So in order to damage him at all, you have to find time in between or even during attacks. Some attacks are safer to do this than others, but every attack at his disposal is a threat and should be taken seriously. There's no disparity between his attacks, there's no downtime to get bored, at least not until you know the boss so well that you can do it in your sleep. I don't think designing a boss exactly like this on a Kingdom Hearts combat system would be good, you'll see what I mean later in this section, but you get the idea. Or how about an example from Kingdom Hearts 2? Let's take Terra. I've actually stated that I like when the arrow phase shows up in this fight because it feels like an easy way to push an entire phase of the fight with minimal effort. But here's the thing, if you whiff a dodging hit by this attack it's pretty much a guaranteed to be a death sentence unless you really know what you're doing. Even though this phase is comparatively a breather, it still comes with a considerable amount of threat. Many of the bosses in BBS have attacks during which no damage can be accomplished safely, and attacks during which there's basically no chance of death and you can just unload on them. I find this style of design to be boring at best because it means you're just waiting around for the one or two attacks during which you can really deal some damage, and you're absentmindedly dumping attacks on them without much recourse on the boss's part during said attacks. All attacks in a boss's arsenal should be dangerous, even if they are designed to be opportunities for retaliation. Next, let's talk about Break. In Terra's version of the fight, he will do something similar to his KH2 counterpart where he goes up into the rafters and shoots down at you. Unlike KH2, however, this section of the boss takes way too long and has nothing interesting going on. The section in KH2 involved a quick time event in order to move the fight along, whereas here you just have to run around and it takes a long time, about 20 seconds. And on my winning attempt he used this move 8 times, during which I could do nothing but run around and wait. The rest of the fight is bog standard and probably the best way to defeat him is just to block his bullets back. Nothing wrong with that, just stating it. Aqua's fight is very similar, a little more fast paced, and doesn't have the sniper section, but it does have an overly easy and overly long desperation move that grinds the pacing of the boss to a halt. This boss excellently exhibits another primary issue with the bosses in this game, their pacing. Any time I've called a boss boring has been because of poor pacing. You see, just because you have full control of a character doesn't mean that you have a free pass to good pacing for boss fights. It is still very important that the developers finally control the pace of a boss so that it doesn't get boring. Bragg is a great example of this because his Kingdom Hearts 2 counterpart is a phenomenally well-paced boss. In the Kingdom Hearts 2 version, he warps around at a steady click, quickly but not so fast that you can't get a bead on him and do some damage. When he goes into sniper mode, it's never long before the first button prompt comes up, and the section will be over not long after. 
He also switches up the arena regularly in order to keep the fight fresh throughout. His DM, while a little overly long, has you perform a series of specific maneuvers in order to dodge it completely, so it doesn't get dull. Except maybe the spam at the end, that might go on a bit too long. Hilariously, Bragg in Birth by Sleep stands in stark defiance to just about everything that made Zigbar so good. His DM takes entirely too long for the level of skill required to dodge it, the sniper sections grind the pace of the boss to a standstill as you wait for him to stop volleying exceptionally easy to dodge bullets at you, and even his normal attacks don't keep him moving very often. He actually settles into sort of long combos, where his version in KH2 had much shorter combos that he could string together in a lot of different ways. Small side note, I actually noticed the same thing happening in Zigbar's rematch in the Kingdom Hearts 3 Remind DLC, where he has these long combos that involve specific volleys of bullets, a very different design philosophy clearly being present from the KH2 version. I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. In fact, I very much enjoy this KH iteration, and I think it fits really well for that game. But here, I don't think he has the same level of intensity in order to make this style of design work better. When the main way to deal with him is just to block his bullets back, like it was in Kingdom Hearts 2, is now, and will be in Kingdom Hearts 3, you've got to figure out how to keep things interesting, lest they get dull. And so, so many bosses in Birth by Sleep can be described as dull due to bad pacing. Last but certainly least, we have Vanitas, our masked friend, who is a wonderful case study in yet another element of terrible boss design present throughout this game. Watch this clip. What he just did there is, in response to taking damage, he randomly decided to just not take the damage, and instead warp above me and hit me. There is no rhyme or reason to this, no feasible way to predict it, and it completely negates whatever you were deciding to do. The fact that this boss is able to completely mitigate whatever damage he wants and strike back with no recourse on the player's part shows a lack of design philosophy so apparent to me that it makes me question if the devs were awake when they put this mechanic in. Perhaps Flora put a spell on them to put them to sleep and they still had a deadline to meet. This is laughable. One thing I will say is that this certainly keeps the pace of the boss up quite a bit, but I'd kind of rather have a boring boss than one that arbitrarily takes significantly longer than it should, as evidenced by the fact that any boss involving Vanitas is automatically labeled as bad in my notes. Having your attacks be completely negated for no reason is beyond frustrating. It makes the combat a crapshoot more than something you can plan and strategize for. It makes this boss feel more like a random number generator than a test of skill. Pick a number between 1 and 10. If it's above 5, your attack hits, otherwise he warps away and strikes you. This auto-retaliation actually ended in unavoidable damage at times. In his third iteration, he gets this long Keyblade Ride DM-esque attack that, you guessed it, grinds the pacing to a halt. The only form of the fight that I marked as not bad is Vanitas 4, Vin's last fight. He gets this new warping attack that has a negative telegraph, literally. A couple times I was hit by this attack before he even appeared next to me. Not to mention, this screws with the camera a whole lot, making it disorienting. The reason I call this boss not bad but middling is because it has a higher, more deliberate pace, and he doesn't seem to auto-retaliate as much as usual. Not good, strictly speaking, but better than most of Vanitas' iterations. Honestly though, looking back, I'm not so sure I wasn't too gracious to this guy, he still sucks. Not to mention, the fight ends with a gimmick section in which your controls completely change and you have to do some quick time events on top of accurately blocking attacks you can only barely see coming. Devs, for the love of all that is good and holy, stop scaling these things with difficulty. Look at this nonsense. The first time I got to this section, on my first try at the boss, mind you, I died in basically two hits to stuff I couldn't have possibly seen coming because you shoved me into a gimmick fight at the end of the final boss of Ven's story. If you're gonna put a gimmick boss fight in your game, either make it optional, losable, or don't scale it with difficulty. I should not have to grind at a gameplay mechanic that has never been used before and will never be used again, just for some story reason. Yes, this section looks cool, it's thematically very neat, whatever, I don't really care because it's a gimmick and it scales with the difficulty you're on, meaning it sucks. They actually had to patch a gimmick fight in KH3 that scaled with difficulty because it was way too hard on crit, that being this fight during the Pirate's World. Vanitas during Aqua's Path actually has an even worse issue. Look at this attack. How did this attack make it through the testing phase? Was there a testing phase? Did they just decide that giving this attack a telegraph would make the fight too easy or something? Because there isn't one, and it gets to you in literal frames. So better just spend any downtime between his attacks perpetually dodge rolling so you don't get randomly smacked by this attack. Was Vanitas just the boss they decided to put all their bad attack design into? No, he wasn't. We haven't gotten to that boss yet. Getting back to auto-retaliation, it would be one thing if this was a problem unique to Vanitas. But I've actually been going out of my way to show you examples of this happening in many other bosses as we've gone over each. 
Not all of them can retaliate in a way that deals damage, but some of them can. Here's Terranord's damage avoiding ability, which literally always leads into a retaliatory attack. With him, you pretty much have to find real openings during or after attacks in order to deal damage, or else you'll just end up in a loop of him using this ability over and over again. This doesn't increase the difficulty of the boss, it just arbitrarily lengthens it and crushes what pacing it had. Here's Terranort and Guardian's version. This doesn't come packaged with a retaliation, but again, it necessitates you wait for openings during attacks. This only accomplishes making the time between his attacks boring, since there's no reason to attack him, you might as well just wait. Why not reduce the time it takes for him to chain attacks and just remove this ability altogether? Because that is the one thing about the late game bosses in this game that makes them very different from late game bosses in Kingdom Hearts 1 and especially 2. They wait around for a weirdly long time in between attacks. If that time isn't supposed to be used to deal damage, then why is it there? It's just bad pacing. Here's Ericus. We've talked about this at length previously, but it's ridiculous he can just throw this out at any time he feels like. Again, I can't help but feel like this is a thoughtless inclusion because this is also the game that got rid of the parry system. If the devs wanted you to basically only ever attack when the boss was in an arbitrary vulnerability state, then why remove the parry system? These two things could probably have gone well together, though I don't think that the boss being able to arbitrarily mitigate damage is ever going to be a good thing, regardless of what mechanics you pair it with. I wonder if this was how they decided to balance the power creep of the main characters, like Nomura said in that interview. If you can only actually hit something like 80% of your strikes, you'll be automatically weakened and you'll have to be more cautious in order to avoid retaliations, right? Sounds like a win-win on paper, but really it just makes the bosses more dull, annoying, and prolonged needlessly. Mostly annoying, though. The way KH2 handled this particular problem was just to make the wrong times to be attacking more dangerous than the correct times. Not that there really were correct times, but if an enemy was actively attacking, you probably wouldn't want to be attacking them back, and if an enemy was in between attacks, that was basically always free game unless the enemy in question didn't stagger. Staggers were also much more common and more reliable back then for most of the fights, while now bosses will basically never stagger in between attacks anymore, and even if there are times you can stagger them during attacks, they sometimes just refuse to. This makes finding safe openings for many bosses frustrating at best and an absolute slog of over-carefulness at worst. So that's all the required bosses in order to roll every credits roll in the game. On top of them, there are a number of optional bosses. Depending on what you consider the Iron Imprisoner to be, there are actually nine. Four of those are four slightly different versions of the Iron Imprisoner, and one of those is Monstro, who barely counts as a boss because he's so easy. The other four are the ones you should be afraid of. As for Iron Imprisoner, I don't have much to say. His attacks have really poor telegraphs, he has long periods of being basically invulnerable, his fourth iteration has an extremely long attack where nearly nothing is happening. He can trap you in this cage, which means you can't move, but this isn't really an issue. Other than that, any issue I have with him is better exemplified by the other super bosses, so I'm just gonna move on from him. Now let's start with the Armor of the Master, essentially a rematch with Ericus. Just for transparency, I fought all of these bosses as Aqua on crit at level 45. This means that I was receiving a ton of damage, enough to knock me down to one hit point in response to most attacks. I ended up turning on 0 EXP in order to get decent damage output, more on that in a second. He has some really similar attacks to his first iteration, most of which are improved versions of his projectile attacks. These are harder to dodge and even more encourage blocking than their original versions. The beam attack I showed from before makes a return, and while being less lame from a difficulty to dodge standpoint, has the added issue of allowing you to just walk to the edge of the arena in order to entirely avoid it, and charge up a shot lock if you're clever. He has two forms that he switches between when he hits you with this attack. This mostly just changes the physical combo he uses. The form he always started in for me had melee combos more similar to his original version. Not bad to deal with at this point even if you do get hit. The other form has a true full health to dead combo. In the sense that it's specifically designed to break through your once more. So if you get hit by this combo, you're basically dead at the level I was at. From what I can tell, you can't break out of this either, and blocking it results in inconsistent staggering at best. This attack was the source of every death I suffered at this guy's hands. Note that this boss actually has a different set of attacks and patterns depending on the character you're playing as, though this for the most part doesn't matter at all, it's just a slight derivative, cool if nothing else. Now the thing I want to show with this boss is the difference between having 0 EXP on and off. Here's my damage output without 0 EXP. Now here's with 0 EXP. It's a pretty massive difference and makes these bosses quite a bit less tedious. Honestly, it might be a bit too strong. It might make the bosses take too little time overall. But I'd take that over them being significantly too long any day. If they dropped that damage floor by, say, 4 points or so and made it universal, this game would be way more enjoyable. Oh well. 
Next, we have No Heart, a fight with Armored Xemnas from Kingdom Hearts 2, though this game's version of him is quite a bit different. It starts out with a fight against this little shield thingy. It sends huge volleys of projectiles at you and will occasionally put down a black hole that sucks you in and blows up after a while. This phase is honestly free though. I found it very easy, especially with my command deck setup, which featured an alternating set of Thunder Surges and Cures. The reason for this is because Thunder Surge gives infinite iframes with just a touch of lag at the end that you can be caught out of, but generally it's a very safe choice for any of these super bosses except one. I'll bring up an issue with this momentarily. No Heart's second phase is a fight with him directly. He stands up, does some speed, and starts attacking like a madman. He has a few different projectile moves and a few different physical combos he will switch between extremely fast. Fast enough that often the projectiles won't even be done flying by the time he's comboing you. He also has a couple other patterns he switches to periodically, one where he flies around in the air, and a couple attacks where he tries to give you some kind of negative status effect like locking you in place or slowing you down. I actually found this boss to be entertaining. He doesn't have any massive bullcrap that you have to deal with, just some fast patterns and tough to dodge attacks. That being said, he basically never leaves himself open, meaning you have to find time to poke him in the middle of attacks. This results in two things. The first is dodge roll spam. If you're not playing as Terra, then you'll be highly encouraged to spam dodge roll so you remain in infinite iframes until you're ready to attack. Second, it results in a de-emphasis on any command that leaves you vulnerable for even a second. Most commands have a wind-up time and a cooldown time in which you are free to be hit, and no heart can and will take advantage of this. The safest option is Thunder Surge due to its high amount of iframes and relatively low ending lag, which usually takes place during a brief stagger on the boss if you time your attack well. So while I do find this boss fun, I can't in good conscience say it's good because of these issues. We'll see this more as we discuss the final two optional bosses, but in short, bad boss design encourages boring strategies rather than interesting ones. I have a cure in between all of my Thunder Surges because that way I can always be two button presses away from a cure if I should get unlucky and fail to stagger him or he just decides to come out of nowhere and hit me. The reason I rate this guy as meh instead of plainly bad is because he does, just barely, give you enough time to get shot locks out, as well as offers some fairly predictable opportunities to use Thunder Surge in order to stagger him for the briefest of moments, and finding both of these opportunities was fun, though I wouldn't feel this way if Dodge Roll or Thunder Surge were unusable. Next up we have Vanitas Remnant. It's Vanitas, so you should know what's up by now. This guy suffers from the same issues as all Vanitas iterations. His attacks are much longer and wider, so he's harder to dodge by a good margin. He also has a bunch of unique quirks. He has low HP but high defense. He will heal himself if you ever use a cure command during the fight, and certain elemental attacks apparently cause him to be more aggressive, though I've yet to be able to find a second source on this. What I do know is that he's designed to be beaten with the mind commands. In an interview, they stated that you needed a specific deck to beat him, and this is likely what they were referring to. Looking at his stats, you can see his high defense and high resistance to all damage types, though his resistance to other is 0.5 times, which is the damage type of the mind commands, and just happens to be his lowest resistance, tied with physical, though I wouldn't recommend using physical due to his ability to warp away and retaliate at any time. You're supposed to bait him into mind traps during the fight. This is easiest done as Aqua with Seeker Mine and this boss was an absolute pushover when I did this. I also still had zero EXP on, which highly corrected my damage output so that the boss ended significantly faster than I think it was supposed to. His attacks are not undodgeable. Most of them are actually fine and decently predictable, though the baggage of being Vanitas means I can't call him a good boss. He's certainly not the worst. No, that honor goes to the remaining boss. Mysterious figure, we finally meet. This was my first time fighting him, and I had heard the horror stories. No one in their right mind liked this boss. In an interview, the team stated their goal with this boss was to make him so hard that Nomura couldn't beat him. This is a bad goal, I promise you. There are so many issues here. Firstly, his attacks come at such an intense clip that he's never open fully, so you have to find types to hit him during his attacks. Sound familiar? Blocking results in inconsistent staggering as well, so you can't fully trust it. Many of the attacks are so horrible that I can't believe they made it in. The clone attack being a great example. If you don't hit the clones within seconds of them spawning, they will all begin to attack over top of each other, leading to what will likely be a constant loop of getting struck while at 1 HP. Your only hope is to start dodge rolling as soon as possible, find a decent time to heal, and then try to hit the clones to make them go away, but doing this is quite difficult. He can also turn invisible, meaning you can't target him or see his attacks. This doesn't make the boss more difficult due to infinite iframe dodge rolls, it just makes it more tedious, and he can do this multiple times during the fight. You can still damage him, though doing so is extremely difficult due to not being able to lock onto him. He completely negates multiple kinds of attacks. With mines, he will just jump over them endlessly, presumably only rarely getting hit by them. This is not unlike some other bosses we've seen, though much, much worse because he's so good at avoiding them. 
Shot locks will be completely negated, so you can't use those either. D-Links will make him instantly go invisible and spawn a bunch of orbs in retaliation, making it more of a hassle than it's worth. Speedrun strats for this boss do involve D-Links, but in order to use them properly, you have to find a very specific time during his patterns in order to avoid him retaliating against you when you use it. So what are we left with? Thunder Surge and Cure. Thunder Surge and Cure. Thunder Surge and Cure. He can even break out of physical damage sometimes by literally rewinding time, and he can then follow that with another attack immediately. It's like they tried every cheap trick in the book to ensure that you couldn't just cheese your way through this boss in any way. A couple of my deaths involved some weird stuff. One saw me get stunned for no reason. This never happened before or since. One death involved him punching through once more. This is either a glitch or an intended mechanic, and either way, I don't like it. So you dodge roll away from attacks and use Thunder Surge every now and again, occasionally using Cure. Sometimes you get hit by one of his many combo moves and stand there as he plays out his power fantasy on your head with his Keyblade before you roll away and cure again. Joseph Anderson in his video on Hearthstone said that sometimes the game feels like you're playing as the AI controlled villain designed specifically to give the other player a fun cathartic experience and that's sometimes how this fight feels, especially when you get hit during the clone attack. It's almost comedic how long a chain of attacks can go during this phase. You're forced to assume the role of a badly designed boss with only three moves, dodge, attack, and heal, while the really cool protagonist gets all of these flashy abilities and can string them together with little to no recourse on your part. He can also cast Doom on you. It counts down from five, and if it reaches zero, you die. Mash X to break out. Every time he hits you with this, it starts with one less second on the clock until it's basically impossible to break out, and it'll just end the fight. Apparently, if your command deck is set up just the wrong way, he will spam this attack over and over, which is a baffling idea that could punish players for seemingly no reason at all. His whip attack can grab you, and if you don't break out of it, he just kills you. In the PSP version, there was no way to break out of it, so if he got you, you were done for. At least in the PS4 version, you can break out, making this attack a non-issue rather than literally being a 100% death sentence. There are two ideas that I have that I want to explore a bit more now that we've gone over all these fights. Firstly, bad boss design encourages boring strategies rather than interesting ones. There's truly no safe alternative to Thunder Surge because every other option is either punished, completely negated, or extremely inconsistent. You can dodge roll around and use a single command and be decently capable of winning sometimes, or you can try to experiment with commands and get bodied most of the time. Take your pick. The fact that this boss, as well as a few of the others, literally tell you you can't use entire game mechanics is just insane to me. If it were one at a time, I'd get that a bit more, but to just lock away D-Link shot locks the grand majority of the command's physical attacks and by extension command styles shows the devs had no idea how to make these attacks work in a boss design to be actually challenging. And that's my second point, and the crux of this whole discussion. Bad boss design is, at least in this game, but I feel pretty often, a band-aid for bad game design. Let me explain. In this game, we have playable characters with multiple screen nuking abilities, abilities which keep them invincible for long periods of time, abilities which can deal a ton of damage with little to no input on the player's part, items which can skip past the build-up process of many of these abilities for the cost of basically nothing, abilities which allow players to stay invincible as long as they can press a single button in succession, mini games which allow them to get significantly powerful abilities very early, abilities which allow them to get treasure chests way before they're meant to, abilities which require nearly no thought in order to use, and a crafting system which allows them to get extremely overpowered passive abilities before the halfway point of the game. The team knew this going in, remember that quote from the end of the last section? The only thing is that by incorporating too much of this new system, the three protagonists are too strong and the importance of tricks to defeat bosses has faded a bit. We're going to work on balancing that out. How do you even design a boss for a game system like this? How would you ever make it even remotely challenging? There are a few options and Mysterious Figure represents all of them. He completely negates all of your most overpowered abilities, D-Links, Shot Locks, and Command Style finishers. This forces you to use much less powerful or safe options. Okay, but that's not enough, right? The player can still use screen nukes and busted items, right? Well, ensure that the player never has time to do that by making the boss attack literally constantly. But the player can still dodge roll infinitely, keeping them completely safe, right? So, ensure the boss attacks so fast and with so many hitboxes that even the slightest screw up means that you'll be back on the edge of your life. You will be forced to use only the most boring and safe strategies available because how else would the boss be even remotely challenging? It couldn't be, and these super bosses prove that. 
The hardest bosses of past games keep you from using certain tactics, like summons in KH1, dry forms or limits in KH2, but never did they even borderline force you to only use one tactic barring maybe a couple bosses in Kingdom Hearts 2. In fact, Terra, the objectively most challenging boss in Kingdom Hearts 2, doesn't keep you from using any of your abilities and he's still extremely hard. That's because nothing in Kingdom Hearts 2 was even close to the caliber of broken that half the mechanics get to in this game, barring things like revenge value exploits. Even then, Terra's design, while extremely difficult, encouraged and even in a sense demanded the use of many of Sora's abilities in order to succeed at anything other than the absolute highest caliber of play. But even when they pull out all the stops and make the hardest boss possible in this gameplay style, they still couldn't make something that was anything more than frustrating. Mysterious Figure is an absolute failure of a boss, hard but unfun, challenging but unfair, difficult for all the wrong reasons, encouraging the use of really boring and safe tactics because they're the only ones that work. But even when this game is at its most freeing, it's still mostly composed of flashy, visually interesting moves that keep you safe and deal a bunch of damage with almost no input on your part. Remember when I said this in the Chain of Memories video? The reason it feels like a different series is because there is less of a focus on the balance between physical combos and magic use, and more of a focus on these repeatable slates that play out, keep you safe, and deal a ton of damage for not very much cost. It's fine for this game in particular because it's a deck builder and also fairly short, but an over-exaggeration of flashy abilities that require almost no player input or thought would harm the series going forward if they were used in a more traditional Kingdom Hearts action RPG experience. Yep, this game was the one I was talking about. I can't get behind this. It may be fun or visually interesting at times, but it's a terrible foundation upon which to build good bosses, and no one boss shows that better than Mysterious Figure. The game's attempt to build a challenge out of these mechanics, and it fails to do anything but frustrate. So we've got a lot of broken mechanics, bosses with terrible pacing, bosses that can auto-retaliate, super bosses that have to suplex this game's entire combat system into the ground in order to be remotely challenging, and a ton of issues that prove to me that this game's design is a regression, even compared to Kingdom Hearts 1 standard. Which, may I remind you, was basically the first 3D action RPG. What gives? Why did this happen? Well, as with anything in the history of Square Enix, it all comes back to Final Fantasy. When I had written out the development proposal, the usual KH team had already been decided on to work on Final Fantasy vs. 13, and so we started thinking about leaving it to another team. That's when the Osaka team came up to us and said, we'll be able to make a better game than any of the other teams, so please let us work on it. Then they made a test version for us with Sora, Donald, and Goofy running smoothly, so we thought we'd leave it to them. At the time, we had just started development on Crisis Core, and the team was having trouble working on the PSP. We showed them the work that Osaka team had done on the test version, and said, look at how much you can do on the PSP. Osaka team is the name given to the development branch of Square Enix based in Osaka, Japan. Prior to this game, they had a short list of releases. Einhander was their first, a side-scrolling shooter game on the PS1. Next, and most similarly to Kingdom Hearts, is Brave Fencer Musashi, also on the PS1, featuring action combat, in a 3D space, though the camera isn't controllable, and apparently there's some light RPG elements. There was a sequel to this one on the PS2 that came out after Kingdom Hearts 1 and just before Kingdom Hearts 2. I haven't played it, so I'm not going to pass real judgment, but the gameplay footage I've found looks less than impressive. Let's also mention that they made three all-star pro wrestling games and then promptly forget they made three all-star pro wrestling games. They then started working on Birth by Sleep for the PS2 before being tasked to make Rechain of Memories. The other side of this coin is Tokyo Team. I think it'd be fair to say that Square Enix's Tokyo team, the one that developed Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, were at this point considered masters of their craft. They were also responsible for many of the Final Fantasy games, if not all of the single player ones. To be clear and factual, Osaka and Tokyo were a part of the same product development division, a fancy name Square Enix used to give their development teams, but that doesn't mean they are the same team in the sense that Osaka did not work on Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 from what I can tell. In 2007, the teams were significantly restructured, though the teams in charge of Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts were still the same department. This was until 2013 when they restructured everything out to 12 different business divisions, and that held until 2019 in which all of those units were consolidated back into four groups. Creative Business Unit 1 is the primary developer of Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts, also known as Square Enix's main cash cows. Business Unit 2 works primarily on Dragon Quest and Nier, also two big hitters for Square. Unit 3 works on the MMORPGs, and Unit 4 works on the Mana series, along with a bunch of games I've never heard of. I mention this primarily because I find it interesting, secondarily to set up for some discussions later in the series, and thirdly to say this. 
Tokyo and Osaka teams are both the same division, but the team in Tokyo were responsible for Final Fantasy and the first two numbered Kingdom Hearts games, whereas Osaka team was responsible for, well, these games no one has heard of. Kingdom Hearts, at the time of Birth by Sleep, was already a massive success story for Square Enix, but no one in their right mind would expect them to use their best team for anything other than Final Fantasy, one of the highest grossing series of video games ever made, bigger than Sonic the Hedgehog, Legend of Zelda, Tomb Raider, and of course, Kingdom Hearts. So Tokyo team was tasked with working on Final Fantasy vs. 13, a game that does not exist except perhaps in spirit. If a spirit could be chopped up into about 600 pieces and forced to possess about 5% of 7 different people. Past this point, the people that used to represent the Tokyo team apparently dissolved into other projects, units, or even quit the company altogether, although I can't confirm this sentiment as readily as the others so it might not be true. The point here stands. The Tokyo team that made Kingdom Hearts 2 either doesn't exist anymore, or if they do, they never worked on Kingdom Hearts again. Meanwhile, Kingdom Hearts was left in the capable hands of a team of people with one side-scrolling shooter, two pseudo-3D action RPGs, and three wrestling games under their belt. And before anyone accuses me of being cynical, I think they did a great job. Birth by Sleep is overall a fun game with an insanely large amount of attention to detail, options, enemies, and bosses with a story that's actually not that bad all considered. My problem is just that Kingdom Hearts 2 set such an incredibly high bar for the enemy and boss design following its final mix re-release and we didn't get anything even close to that here. Kingdom Hearts 2 set so many standards for how boss design, leveling, abilities, stats, all of that should be handled, and this game actively unlearns the lessons Tokyo Team learned after Kingdom Hearts 1. It sucks because we got such a great game, not perfect by any means, but closer than an action RPG had ever been to that point. And not only does it feel like we are resetting to square one with this game, it actually feels like we've regressed from Kingdom Hearts 1's standard even. I can't blame Osaka for not getting some of these things right. It took Tokyo Team two tries before making a boss as good as Roxas, and they still made Vexen and Zexion in the same game. But stuff like putting the aerial recovery button on square, or failing to set a decent damage floor is inexcusable when the example had been set so clearly in Kingdom Hearts 2, and the benefits could so clearly be seen. But listen, I've spent enough time complaining about this. Just buckle up, because there's going to be a lot more of this in the future entries in the series. Let's just say it took Osaka more than two tries to start getting these things right. Alright, that's enough negativity for one long form critique, let's overview the last half of the game. A few important things happen at Radiant Garden that tie into either the rest of the story or future stories. Aqua meets Kairi and there are two moments that matter here. Firstly, Aqua casts a spell of dubious origin on Kairi which she says, One day when you're in trouble, the light within you will lead you to the light of another. Someone to keep you safe. Kairi also at some point during this cutscene, which you'll certainly be watching right now, touches Aqua's Keyblade. This matters a lot for reasons we'll get to later. The party then gets together to fight Trinity Armor, and afterward the three of them have a tough conversation. And what in this dangerous task, Terra? It doesn't sound like what the Master told you to do. It might be a different route, right? but I'm fighting the darkness. I'm not so sure. I've been to the same worlds as you, and I've seen what you've done. You shouldn't put yourself so close to the darkness. Listen to yourself, Aqua. Terra would never- You mean you've been spying on me? Is that what he said to do? The Master's orders? He was only- I get it. Terra! Just stay put. <laughs> I'm on my own now, all right? Terra, please, listen. The Master has no reason to distrust you, really. He was just worried. You're awful, Aqua. But the Master loves Terra. And you know that too. Were you also ordered to take me home? Aqua, now that you're a Keyblade Master, You've let it go to your head. I'm gonna go find Terra. Finally, Vin meets Lee and they have a sparring session. I actually like how they set up their relationship here. It explains the unspeakable bond that Roxas and Axel have in the organization. We've gone over the next four worlds in enough detail at this point that I think we can move on from them and skip to the next story beat. All three characters, after their trips to Neverland, find themselves at Destiny Islands. During Terra's visit, he finds Riku and sees something in him and performs a ritual which passes the keyblade on to another person. Riku grabs the keyblade and Terra says this little speech, turning Riku into a keyblade wielder when he's older. So the keyblade doesn't choose people? Keyblade wielders do? Let's table that for now. Aqua later shows up and finds Sora and Riku. 
Aqua can somehow tell that Riku's been given the Keyblade, and so decides not to give Sora one because she sees how difficult it's been on her and her friends to have multiple Keyblades. While Terra is at Destiny Island, Vin is at the Badlands, learning about his past. Xehanort talks to him there and tells him that he has the power to forge something called the Keyblade. Not the Keyblades you and I carry. Key, the most ancient word. Some say Kai, but the meaning is the same. Death, a letter that spells endings. Vin heads back to the land of departure and confronts Ericus, who ends up drawing his keyblade on Vin, and is ready to strike Vin down, but Terra shows up and protects him. This is what leads to fighting Ericus as Terra. Terra tosses Vin through a portal and he ends up at Destiny Island, wherein Vinitas shows up, claiming Vin is strong enough now to forge the Keyblade. Vin's not interested, but is given a flashback of Xehanort training him before going to the Land of Departure for the first time. Vin fights a bunch of Neo Shadows, but he's losing, and Xehanort says it's because he's holding in the Dark Impulses. Xehanort tells him to forge the Keyblade, but Vin gets bodied. What's kind of odd here is that this isn't how the Keyblade is created. According to Xehanort's own understanding as postulated in the 7th Xehanort report, which are scattered throughout the game, one must have a heart of pure light and a heart of pure darkness fight in order to forge the Keyblade. Venetus is formed when Xehanort separates Vin's light and darkness. Back on Destiny Island, Venetus says he's going to go to the Keyblade graveyard and force Ventus to watch as he chokes out the life of Terra and Aqua. Then we'll see how long you play the pacifist. Wait! Aqua ends up finding Mickey and brings him back to Yen Sid, who somehow knows that Ericus was killed and that Terra and Xehanort have something to do with it. How? Who knows? Aqua says she doesn't believe Terra would do that. Yen Sid also somehow knows that Terra would be at the Keyblade graveyard, and tells Aqua to go there but to be on her guard. This comes across as a contrived way to get her to go to the Keyblade graveyard, but the reasons the characters go to the Keyblade graveyard are always contrived anyway, so it's not unique. Aqua and Terra get there first and have a brief conversation, Terra apologizing for what he's done and promising to never stray again. Aqua says he will because he did before. Where did that faith she just had go? Vin walks up and says Xehanort wants him and Vanitas to fight to create the Keyblade. Vin asks for them to put an end to him before Xehanort shows up, and the fight commences. There's some full-on Dragon Ball Baruto nonsense here that ends with Vin getting turned to ice. This is actually pretty harrowing if you play Terra's story first, because for the rest of the Keyblade graveyard scenes in his story, you're just left to assume he actually died. He didn't, but he got close. This also doesn't really make sense, because the whole point of all this was to have Vin and Vanitas fight. So why would Xehanort bring him right up to the point of death? Anyway, Kingdom Hearts appears for a reason that's explained later, and Terra fights Xehanort and Vanitas. After that, Xehanort takes control of Terra's body, quoting one for one the big Ansem speech from the end of Kingdom Hearts 1 because of nostalgia, but Terra's armor wakes up and fights back. Terra's story ends sort of limply. Aqua tries to resuscitate Ven before Bragg walks up. They fight, and afterward he says his job was to distract Aqua. Vanitas shows up and strikes Aqua in a fantastic, awkwardly animated scene. At this point in Ven's version of the events, he gets up and fights Vanitas. It's revealed here that the unversed are actually negative emotions flowing from Vanitas. They end up fusing together essentially and have another fight on the dive to the heart, Vanitas attempting to complete the Keyblade. Back to Aqua, there's a cool shot of her floating in a death pose before Mickey revives her and she gets up and fights Vanitas, who has the Keyblade. Aqua wins after Terra and Ven lend her their strength. She shatters the Keyblade, killing Vanitas and leaving Ven behind. A big explosion consumes everyone in the area. Later, Aqua wakes up in Yen Sid's tower, Mickey having brought her and Ven back there. Vin's heart is sleeping, and though it may return, it also may not, and he may sleep like this forever. Aqua then says she may know how to find Terra. Once you've finished all three characters' stories, you get to play the final episode, which completes the story. Aqua is taking Vin somewhere when he shoots a keyhole in his sleep, Aqua bringing him through it. Aqua takes Vin to the demolished castle of the Land of Departure and leaves him on a throne, sealing the place behind her. It shifts and turns into Castle Oblivion, a voice saying those that visit will be lost to oblivion and won't be able to solve the mystery. Back in Radiant Garden, Aqua finds Terranort, who seems to barely be able to remember who he is. Aqua asks for him to fight the darkness, but Terranort responds that Terra's heart has been extinguished. Aqua then introduces herself for no other reason than the rule of cool, and they fight. <laughs> I have to do something, or we'll both be lost. 
As soon as I thought. But I promise I'll be there one day to wake you up. Now we cut back to Sora and Riku on Destiny Island. Sora? What's wrong? Huh? Your. Uh. That. That. It's like. Something squeezing me inside. Somebody up there must be sad. Up where? They say every world is connected by one great big sky. So maybe there's somebody up there in all those worlds who's really hurting. And they're waiting for you to help them. Well, gee, do you think there's something I could do? Hmm. Maybe they just need you to open your heart and listen. I don't know, Riku. You say some weird stuff sometimes, but I'll try it. Okay. Mm. Ansem and the other students find Terranort's body, and they take him to the castle. Aqua wanders around the Land of Darkness, wondering if she should fade into darkness here. Terra and Vin's Keyblade show up and destroy the dark sides, giving Aqua hope. In the post credit scene, we see Vin's heart hides itself away inside Sora. This confirms the connection between Vin and Sora, and that Sora was the newborn heart from the beginning of the game. In time, the worlds would be saved by these two heroes. Can't you just let this story be its own thing? Why do you have to keep making references to the stuff that hasn't happened yet? Oh well, the game's over now, except not quite. Final Mix got a huge, beefy, Cadillac Escalade-sized secret episode with lots of story tidbits, mostly in the opening cutscene. In the first section, we see Terra and Xehanort chatting it up inside Terranort, presumably. This is mostly just a posturing match that ends in Xehanort revealing he has other avenues beyond Terra to use to complete his goals. In Radiant Garden, Brag double-checks to make sure Terranort isn't still Terra. Aqua meets a cloaked figure in the Realm of Darkness that sounds awfully like Ansem the Wise. On Destiny Island, Sora has decided he's going to accept the call Mickey gave him in the letter that appeared at the end of Kingdom Hearts 2. There's a few scenes with Aqua wandering around the Realm of Darkness, and then we get to more gameplay. This is a dense section of gameplay with lots of fights against some unique enemies. I was surprised to see it is actually balanced competently. I was fully expecting to struggle or have to come back after grinding some levels, but it was a good difficulty, despite the fact that enemies were hitting me for most of my health in one strike. There was also a humorous issue where enemies would fall off the map and derp around underneath the platforms, which was annoying because I had to kill them to move on. Another sort of funny glitch happened during the fight with Darkhide. I think what happened here is that I did enough damage to move into his next phase just as I died, so the game didn't really know what to do. It played the phase change cutscene and then just faded up on Aqua floating there and wouldn't do anything else. Regardless, this is a cool portion of gameplay, definitely more substantial than I was expecting. After that, not much happens. We see a castle, some scenes from Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, and the secret episode ends. Like many prequel sequels, this game can't stop talking about things that haven't happened yet. The presence of Sora, Riku, and Kairi, even though only one of them contributes anything at all to this story, is just the most obvious and egregious example. This game just can't get its hands out of the series' spaghetti pot, despite the fact that it's burning itself in hot, salty water. Many ideas introduced here either conflict with or completely retcon elements of the story presented so far. Many people say that there aren't any retcons, there's just information we don't have yet. I think this is blatantly a misunderstanding of what a retcon is. So, what is a retcon? One place to start would be the Oxford Dictionary, which states a retcon is a piece of new information that imposes a different interpretation on previously described events, typically used to facilitate a dramatic plot shift or account for an inconsistency. The latter is the one I think most people use the term to refer to, and that's the one people are definitely trying to say doesn't exist in this series. The Wikipedia article on retroactive continuity gives an even more complex definition, taken from a 2007 article on The Telegraph titled, One of These Comic Heroes Really Is Dead. It reads that a retcon is a literary device, in which facts in the world of a fictional work which have been established through the narrative itself are adjusted, ignored, supplemented, or contradicted by a subsequently published work which recontextualizes or breaks continuity with the former. The motivations for which one might do this are then listed underneath that. 
Reading from the bottom up, they say, to match reality when assumptions or projections of the future are later proven wrong, to change or clarify how the prior work should be interpreted, to correct or overcome errors or problems identified in the prior work since its publication, to respond to negative fan reception of previous stories, and most operatively to us in this discussion, to accommodate desired aspects of sequels or derivative works which would otherwise be ruled out. I don't believe Kingdom Hearts has ever, at least to this point in Birth by Sleep, had a retcon which legitimately changed something from the past. They just supplement information in order to tell the stories in whatever way Nomura decides is best in the moment. To give an example not from Kingdom Hearts, let's say we have a story where a character dies. Because the fans love said character so much, the writers bring the character back through the use of time travel. At one point, one character says, why did no one tell me we could time travel? And the person who came back says, well, you never asked. Cue laugh track, ha ha ha, but that's actually a pretty common form of retcon. The existence of time travel is not a factual retcon in the world of the fiction, as long as the writers hadn't explicitly stated prior that time travel couldn't exist. Kingdom Hearts adds stuff to its story, changing the way we perceive the events all the time. It's been done before this game. I would argue that the existence of nobodies is in itself a retcon because they are in no way mentioned prior to KH1FM's Ansem reports and primarily offered a way for the villain to come back on top of being a really cool way to explore the heart in Kingdom Hearts 2. Ansem not actually being Ansem, as in the differentiation between Ansem the Wise and Xehanort his apprentice, is also a retcon, one which led to a lot of interesting story moments in Kingdom Hearts 2. See, retcons don't have to be bad, but you can't ignore or swear away their existence just because they scare you or you can't stand the thought of someone criticizing your favorite piece of media. They are a storytelling tool just like any other. My problem with almost all the retcons in Birth by Sleep is that they change the intended interpretation of events in Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and the mobile titles in ways that I find to be either frustrating or significantly less engaging. The Keyblade is one sticking point, though it is unfortunately not as easy as just saying the game ruined what Kingdom Hearts 1 established. Most of our information on how the Keyblade worked in Kingdom Hearts 1, that the Keyblade chooses its own master, came from people who in retrospect had a really limited understanding of the Keyblade. In this one, Keyblades can be passed down from Keyblade Masters. Terra has to perform this whole ritual, whereas Kyrie just kind of touches Aqua's Keyblade and that's enough. So basically, anyone worthy of wielding the Keyblade simply needs to touch a Keyblade and it'll be bequeathed to them. But the original understanding is still true, because no such ceremony is performed for Sora, who ends up gaining the Keyblade anyway. One could argue that it was because of Ven's heart inside of him, but Nomura actually debunked this in an interview. This would be a great inconsistency to rattle on over if this was the case, but I use interviews all throughout this series to support my claims, so this should be no exception. The problem in this lies then in the fact that Riku and Sora were fighting over a Keyblade in Kingdom Hearts 1 when, according to this, they shouldn't have needed to do so. They had two different Keyblades, right? The fact that Sora was canonically deserving of the Keyblade from the get-go is evidence that the whole Riku vs Sora who deserved the Keyblade really discussion was complete bupkis. They both deserved it, and the fact that neither of them had the Keyblade at the same time is a complete coincidence, I guess. I haven't seen a decent interpretation of this. Maybe there is one out there. Feel free to give me one in the comments if you have it. We don't have any other examples to my knowledge of a Keyblade just randomly picking a different master because the original one failed to be worthy in this new context, which makes this suspect. That was one of my favorite things in that game, and now it just seems meaningless. There are still other issues with how the Keyblades are handled now. Consider this question from the same interview. Roxas, the Sora plus Ventus nobody, was able to use a Keyblade. In contrast, Xemnas, the Terra plus Master Xehanort nobody, wasn't able to use the Keyblade. Why is this? Nomura's response was as follows. I'd rather that point remain a mystery. It's possible that he intentionally wasn't using one. If this was the case, it would completely undermine, <laughs> I don't know, the entire plot of 358 Days, because their goal in that game was to have a Keyblade wielder who could gather hearts for them because no one else could. Why would they need Roxas or Shion explicitly if Xemnas could just do so himself? Better yet, it undermines their motivations in Kingdom Hearts 2 also because they needed Sora to continue destroying Heartless to collect hearts. But if any one of their members was a Keyblade wielder, they could have, at any point, just killed Sora and moved on with their plan. These may seem like innocuous changes, but in a series like this, they spiral until they are cutting jagged holes in the side of the ship. Eventually, it's filling with water and the riders are making buckets out of retcons just to bail out the boat. More retcons come in the flavor of oversignification. 
A lot of things in Kingdom Hearts 1 especially are given so much significance in the universe of the fiction that it borders on ridiculosity. The first and easiest example to discuss is the Palpu Fruit. In Kingdom Hearts 1, the Palpu Fruit was just a little fairy tale esque story about a fruit that could magically bond two people together forever. There's a high likelihood that the intention of this story detail was to show through the events of the game that they don't need a magical fruit to be bonded together, and ultimately the fruit is nothing more than a symbol. Well, it's still technically nothing more than a symbol, but in Birth by Sleep it is now a symbol that apparently is able to cross world boundaries. How she heard about this fruit is beyond me, and it gives what was supposed to be, literally, canonically, symbolically, and thematically, a sleepy, meaningless island to which only those that come from it could give meaning, a folklore that spans numerous worlds and crosses impassable barriers with no feasible explanation. Yet another example of this is with Kairi and her destiny. How does Aqua know she's important? Why does Aqua cast a spell on her? That spell is also vague enough that Nomura had to explain what it was doing in an interview. Aqua declaring that Kairi is important is basically a prophetic declaration in terms of what it's doing for the story, and those are always underbaked and basically amount to the writer body puppeting the characters into the roles they are meant to fill, rather than writing situations in which they would naturally fulfill those roles, whether through the kindness of their heart or some sort of moral obligation. This is more succinctly put as a contrivance. I don't think it's quite as bad as literally saying Kairi is a generic chosen individual, but I still stand by that it takes away some of the impact of Kingdom Hearts 1 when the characters in that story apparently are quote unquote important in a cosmic I sense great things in your future sort of way, rather than just allowing them to be plucky impetuous teens that are able to enact good change in the world through sheer force of their will and hearts alone. An example of adding significance to a future plot development done right is with Ventus and Lee. It's a small detail, the game doesn't dwell on it for long, but it adds a bit to their stories and days in Kingdom Hearts 2 rather than changing how we are meant to interpret them. Their interactions here set a foundation on which their future relationship can be built. That's good, that's how prequels should be written. Now let's look at some details that tie more into the fiction's past, as in stuff that happened before Birth by Sleep. The biggest, most centerpiece-ish example is the Keyblade War, the emblem of which backdrops the most important scenes in the game. Am I the only one that feels like having this many Keyblades kinda undermines the importance of the ones we already had? I'm fine with three, five, even seven at a time, but this is an insanely large amount of Keyblades, and for what? Every person that's ever wielded a Keyblade is de-emphasized by at any point making it extremely commonplace. Isn't it more interesting when, back then, Sora was quite a bit more special in that he was the only Keyblade wielder for the Realm of Light? Even if the information itself doesn't technically conflict with Kingdom Hearts 1, the intended interpretation and its thematic weight absolutely does. In Kingdom Hearts 1, they refer to it as the Keyblade. You know, THE Keyblade. Back then, there were two, the Keyblade of the Realm of Light and the one of the Realm of Darkness. Sora had the former and Mickey had the latter. I was always under the impression that the Keyblade to unlock people's hearts that Riku wields in Kingdom Hearts 1 toward the climax of Hollow Bastion was a fake Keyblade formed by unexplained means, but there's a third if you want it. BBS makes it clear as mud that that's the Keyblade of Hearts referred to in the Xehanort reports, though how it was formed when it needed seven princesses of heart and they only ever had six, as the seventh was inside Sora, is a plot hole not even really worth discussing because it just doesn't matter much. In Kingdom Hearts 2, there were definitely three. Riku had the one of the in-between world, though it's debatable that Kairi also had a Keyblade, which Riku gives to her for some reason in the world that never was. We know with information present in this game that this is in fact a Keyblade and it belonged to her, but back then it was a weird little blip that doesn't get referenced or paid off in the future. Even in Kingdom Hearts 2, multiple organization members refer to either Roxas or Sora as the Keyblade's chosen one, implying exclusivity. We have to reckon with the fact that this term is semantically incorrect now, though it technically was back then. Too. Considering many of these people, notably Zigbar, worked with Xehanort before becoming nobodies, and it's a plot point that they still remember their previous lives, Zigbar should already know about the Keyblade War and how the Keyblade works. The only time he refers to that stuff is actually in that one terrible cutscene that was written after the story for Breath by Sleep was a little more set in stone. In fact, why does no one remark that Roxas looks a lot like Ventus when about half of them should remember him from when they were alive? Well, the answer is because Roxas wasn't written with Ventus in mind. Neither were any of the nobodies. Xemnas does doesn't use a Keyblade because Master Xehanort, the Keyblade-wielding lawnmower man, didn't exist back then. Kingdom Hearts 1's interpretation of the Keyblade doesn't exactly fit because it wasn't written with the ideas of BBS in mind. All of these things are retcons, and most of them do not work when given thought. The Secret Xehanort reports also present some issues. These are written by Master Xehanort, mostly prior to the events of the game, and you get them piecemeal throughout each character's story. Let's hit some highlights. Keyblade wielders, back before the worlds were cast into darkness and separated, fought over Kingdom Hearts, which is apparently an aggregate of hearts. 
those specifically owned by the worlds, not the people within them. The person who opens the door to Kingdom Hearts gets to form the new world and ascends into something beyond human. This is why the Keyblade War was fought. The Keyblade War caused the world to be plunged into darkness, and the little bits of light that remained formed the current capital W world, the one with a bunch of little worlds and barriers which separate them. The Keyblade of Light and Dark came from their respective realms, but Xehanort here coins a new Keyblade, the Keyblade of Heart, the only Keyblade that can open the door to Kingdom Hearts. Apparently, the only way to forge a Keyblade of Heart is to get seven hearts of pure light together, and then you can forge the Keyblade of Heart and open the door to Kingdom Hearts. Presumably, this is what the Keyblade Riku has at the end of Hollow Bastion is, but again, I don't really understand how it exists given the requirement of needing seven pure hearts. Xehanort then explains the Keyblade. The Keyblades we know are said to be man-made counterparts to Kingdom Hearts, but the Keyblade coexists with Kingdom Hearts, whatever that means. A small tangent here, did anyone else think that Keyblades were essentially beings of their own in some way? I mean, when you say the Keyblade chooses its master, that's the implication, that the Keyblade is not a physical entity, but sort of a force that has its own agendas. So now we're saying that Keyblades are man-made? Are there still people making Keyblades today? What does that process look like? I'm not necessarily asking for the game to answer these questions right now, just pondering out loud. Anyway, a heart of pure light and heart of pure darkness must clash in order to forge the Keyblade. And when this happens, Kingdom Hearts is summoned, though this one is special. Unlike a Kingdom Hearts brought about artificially through heart collection, this Kingdom Hearts is a perfect and complete union of the world's hearts. Xehanort says he wishes to form the Keyblade and to have the Keyblade War fought over Kingdom Hearts once again. Xehanort then explains his process for creating vessels for himself, like what he did to Terra, and desires to open Kingdom Hearts in order to create the next world in which light and darkness exist in perfect equilibrium. He mentions Ventus, who's unsuitable as a vessel, but he could use him to form the Keyblade. The rest of the reports just detail events from the games which we already know, like Terra being Xehanort's choice for vessel, or why he came back to the Land of Departure. What bothers me about these reports is that they contradict themselves and the stories of other games, and they contain details that just seem to be half-baked. If a Keyblade of Heart is the only way to open Kingdom Hearts, then why were the Keyblade wielders fighting over Kingdom Hearts? Did any of them have a Keyblade of Heart, or did they just not know this? What does it mean for the Kingdom Hearts formed by the Keyblade to be more perfect than that of Heart Collection? If Ansem Seeker of Darkness and Xemnas both knew all of this, and they should, especially Xemnas because nobody's remembering their human pasts is literally a plot point in days, then why wouldn't they also be trying to forge the Keyblade? Ansem tries to forge the Keyblade of Heart, but Xemnas doesn't seem to care about any of this stuff and just wants hearts for him and his pals. And again, what on God's green earth does Keyblades are man-made counterparts to Kingdom Hearts even mean? You see what I mean when the writing in this game just feels sloppy? I guess I can't blame them. The story was already becoming a spaghetti mess of nonsense by this point, and it's difficult to add spaghetti to an already full pot of spaghetti without something spilling out. The place where I think the story works is in the exploration of its own themes and narrative. Terra, Aqua, and Ventus are adequately well-written characters, and their stories play out in a mostly satisfying way. Terra actually grows quite a bit throughout. At the beginning, he's a pretty typical hothead brute that will never own up to his mistakes. By the end of the game, though, he is willing to admit that he was wrong multiple times throughout the story, and he will do everything he can to make it right. That being said, it is a bit forced. He learns the lessons mostly after Radiant Garden, when he storms off because Aqua accused him of doing bad stuff, but the lessons he learns in Deep Space or Neverland don't seem impactful enough to actually teach him how to own up to his mistakes. That being said, I guess I'd rather have some forced character growth over none at all. Ventus debatably has more character growth than Terra, though in a different direction, and it feels much more earned. He goes through a lot of hardships and has to come to terms with his past, and it makes sense that he'd be in the state he's in by the time they get to the Keyblade Graveyard. The scene with Lee, once again, is excellent foreshadowing of their relationship. Aqua, on the other hand, doesn't grow much at all. She's the picture of a teacher's pet know-it-all at the beginning and the middle, and she's still basically that by the end, except people just accept that she's right all the time rather than challenging her on it like they did before. She flat out tells Terra he will fail again, and no one bats an eye, whereas at Radiant Garden, Terra and Ventus both took offense to a much more understated version of this same sentiment. It makes me wonder if the writers on these games just have issues with female characters. She actually has similar problems to Kairi in that she doesn't really get affected much by the stuff that happens to her. As for Master Xehanort, the villain and mastermind of the plot, he's evil. Boy howdy is he evil. 
It's one of those, this guy is so clearly evil, how can no one in the story see it type things that is often associated with melodramas. No, I don't mean that term derisively. I mean the genre of writing called melodrama, the one Star Wars has always been a part of, where plots are usually simple battles between easily distinguishable good and evil, and people wear white and black to signify which side they're on. My problem with this is just that the story involves so much inherent trust in Master Xehanort that it strains believability when he's presented like this. Unlike the other villains so far, I feel like too much of his plan basically needs the explanation presented in the secret reports in order to be understood. I didn't feel like you needed them before, and they just added some nice context, but in this one it's not entirely clear why he wants to forge the Keyblade or find Kingdom Hearts or start the Keyblade War again. I do think the last section of each character's stories at the Keyblade Graveyard largely works. It's a climactic moment where everything comes together in a satisfying way. The connection between the characters, while sometimes a deus ex machina, is set up somewhat well and provides a thorough line for the worlds as they lead to the conclusion. It's good. I actually found myself liking the story of this game a lot more than I thought I would. I think it's pretty clear that the story of this game largely works, despite its faults, when it isn't trying to explain or recontextualize details from the past games. When it does so, it flails about in a sort of embarrassing way, and I just wish it could have minded its own business a little bit more. So we've come to the end of yet another episode in the Fall of the Kingdom series. Going into Birth by Sleep, I truly thought I was going to hate it. I used to, for sure. Its combat struck me as interesting, but ultimately a failure. Its story was dull and predictable, the characters were cardboard, the bosses were either boring or horribly bad. Something funny has happened for every game in this series though. For the ones I really liked, I found faults. Sephiroth or the stats based nature of Kingdom Hearts 1, Zexion or the cutscene additions in Kingdom Hearts 2. And for the ones I didn't like so much, I found positivity. In Days, it was the incredible story. For Birth by Sleep, it looks like that's the case once again. And one thing these two games share is that their concepts are very much story driven. Days tells its story in the only way that game could, and the experience of playing through it, while dull, does affect how I experience those scenes, and it does make the story better. What I'm saying here is I was wrong to say the HD cutscene compilation is the superior way to experience that game, though maybe someday, in the not too distant future, I'll compile all the things I was wrong about into one big clickbaitly titled roundup. I wouldn't call Birth by Sleep's story incredible by any means, but it certainly surprised me with its depth and the exploration of its primary theme, both in gameplay and in narrative. It built its core mechanics around this theme, and the multi-story nature of the game was crafted solely to explore it, and I honestly can say that it surprised me. I like Birth by Sleep's narrative quite a bit, but there was something I said when I finally beat Mysterious Figure just a few days prior to writing this. I turned to my wife, who had just woken up for the day, coffee cup clutched in hand, and I said, it's over, it's done, and now I never have to play Birth by Sleep again. Even now, I can't stomach the thought of spending another minute staring gloss-eyed at the screen as Aqua shifts into another command style I don't want, or Terra grinds to a screeching halt at the end of his dash, or a powerful command is ended by a love tap from off-screen, or a boss decides once more wasn't actually a rule he cared to follow, or the devs design a boss so hard Nomura couldn't beat it and decided that's the barometer upon which their super bosses would be measured. I never again want to watch as Aqua gets beaten up by 10 copies of the same person in a scene that is probably 95% similar to a scene from a pornography at least 5% of my viewers have seen, though I have not because pornography is for losers. I don't want to have to dejectedly, defeatedly install one by one a Thunder Surge, a Kuraga, a Thunder Surge, a Kuraga, a Thunder Surge, a Kuraga, a Thunder Surge, and one final Kuraga, as I prepare with beating heart and lowering self-respect to challenge once again one of the most abhorrently designed bosses in gaming history. Despite liking the story, I know there's a good chance this is the legacy Birth by Sleep will leave imprinted with a cattle prod into my brain. Because I know myself. But... This is an acquaintance I don't mind saying goodbye to. Thank you for watching. If you like this kind of content and have some disposable income lying around, you can consider supporting the channel through my YouTube memberships. Those at the second and third tiers get access to videos a week early, and those at the highest tier get status updates, members only videos, and their names shouted out. So here goes Cole, OMFG, It's Justin, The Monkus, Josiah Keen, and Devilorn. 
Thanks to all of these people for the extra support. As I always say, only consider supporting if you think the content I make is worth the money. The benefits are just a cherry on top. Now, as a reward for those that have stuck around this long, here's a funny little tidbit from my research. I mentioned in the story analysis section an interview that asks some really difficult to answer questions. One of my favorites is this one. In this title, the dark influence of the Heartless isn't breaking down the walls between worlds. So in this period before gummy ships, why are Donald and Goofy able to travel to the mysterious tower? And Nomura replies, you can think of it as being thanks to Yen Sid, and also because the Mysterious Tower is a loophole world in the first place, so it comes under slightly different rules than the ones that connect the other worlds. By the way, when Donald and Goofy visit the Mysterious Tower in Kingdom Hearts 2, they say, isn't this tower strange, even though they know it from Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. This is because the floors are constructed differently to the previous time they visited, which is strange. The reason this is so funny to me is because that isn't the line he should have been trying to explain, it's this one. Master Wilson was here? <laughs>